Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Actually, you've been here the whole time I've been gone. It's good to see you again. Um, we have a uh, special edition of uh, the Nature Journal Workshop today. Um, I'm your host, John Muir Laws, with my co-host, Vea Moore. Today, we are joined by Gael Braceres Calvis, and um, we'll be introducing our special guest in just a moment, um, all the way from Argentina. And um, we are, uh, uh, Gael, just delighted to have you with us. Before we start our portion of the show today, um, our amazing co-host, uh, Avea Moore, is going to let us know about some of the opportunities and things going on in the nature journaling community right now. There are many ways to get involved with this, uh, with this movement. Uh, Avea, great to see you, and what's happening? It's wonderful to see you, Jack, and it's good to see everybody here today. Um, so what's happening today? We've got... So drink your water. Um, last thing before I pass it on, there's another book I want to talk about real fast. Um, it's not exactly a new book, but it is a new version of a book that's a classic. Look at this! I got it off of Jack's website in Espanol, Diario Ilustrado de la Naturaleza. Finally, if you want a copy in Spanish, please go get this. It's like making me really, really happy. And on that note, Speaking of Spanish and the Spanish-speaking world, I want to present to you Jack and his guest, Gael. Gael. I'm saying, okay, Gael um, Braceres Calvis um, about the birds, los pájaros de Argentina. And let's begin. Thank you. Hey, um, Avea, thank you so much. Um, so uh, we are absolutely delighted to um, have you with us today, uh, Gael. So Gael is an enthusiastic observer, birder, and journaler in Argentina. And um, today, um, Gael is going to be sharing with us some of um, the, the amazing birds from his country. And we are going to be, um, uh, we'll take a look at some endemics, um, as well as some neotropical migrants that connect Argentina with North America. And um, uh, so, uh, Gael, welcome to the Nature Journal Workshop. And um, how, did you get, how did you get started nature journaling? I started bird watching and then I started nature journaling because I love to draw since I'm a little kid. So when I started watching birds, I said, why don't I draw them? And well, I started learning and learning. So, well. that's, that's great. Um, and uh, perhaps uh, towards the, the end of the workshop, we'd love to take a look through if you have any of your journal pages from um, Argentina and the, the the birds that you're seeing there, um, you have sent me a, a PowerPoint presentation or a, a, a slide presentation that is going to highlight three birds, right? And um, what I thought we could do is um, what we'll do is we'll we'll, yes. we'll spend a little bit of time with the first bird. And you can talk to us about it. When you want me to go on to the next slide, I'll move that over. And um, then, uh, and when we get to the last slide for that bird, we'll stop and I'll do a little demonstration about, with some suggestions for how we might go about drawing that bird. And so we're going to learn a little bit about the natural history of some of these species. And... Um, then we will um, also have a chance to uh, get some ideas and tips on how to draw them. Um, so I know that there may be some, uh, some bandwidth um, challenges. Um, when we jump over to the slides, 
it might be a good idea to turn off your video because then your computer will devote more resources to the audio portion of it. But um, before we do it, it's just, it's really good to see you again, my friend. Yes, I'm, I'm delighted. All right. Now, um, I am going to share my screen and um, I'm going to bring up your, here we go, um, your presentation. Um, I am going to close this down. Um, we have um, hide the video panel and I'm going to hide the floating meeting controls here. So, um, for you, please. Um, would it be at all helpful if the rest of us turn off our video cameras as well to help the feed run more smoothly for you? Um, I, I don't really know how that works. So, um, okay. um, but let, let's, let's just try it like this, um, at the start. Um, actually, let me, uh, <clears throat> right. So our, 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 our first bird is the uh, Rufus Honoro. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this bird and why you chose it and what's so cool about it? Well, I chose this bird because, um, well, first it's Argentina's national bird, so it's an important bird. Um, in the north of Argentina, it's easy to see. Here where I live, in the south, it's not so easy. Um, but, well, this is a beautiful fur. When you see it, well, it's, it's incredible. Um, this bird also makes some nests that aren't normal. They use mud and, uh, well, some grass, and they make like ovens. So, well, they'll, they'll be in it, so you can see how they make their nests. Oh, that is really cool. So there's a, a hollow space inside there, and it looks like yeah. they are, they're just taking mouthfuls of mud and uh, making a little adobe house. Yes. Mm. It's very cool because you, you can see the nests and you imagine how do they build them and it's a and they do it fast. It's not a slow process. They do it pretty fast. Um, mm. But it's incredible. About how long would you guess that it takes to make a nest structure like this? Mm, maybe a few days. But that's some cool. birds take a lot of time. So that's why I think that. It, 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 it looks like both the male and the female are, which appear to be, uh, have similar plumage, are taking part in nest building. Um, so it's neat to see them kind of teaming up there to bring in those mouthfuls of mud. Yes. They still don't have a difference. So you see them and they are easy. they are just the same. So if you want to specify which one is which, it's very hard. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Please, please repeat the last sentence. That if you want to, or a female, it's very hard because they are practically equal. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a, that's a beautiful looking bird. Um, and are the nests, this one appears to be 
um, up on top of some post? Are the nests usually placed in 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 exposed locations? Um, uh, like up, up on posts or on. You can find the nest in the city, in the forest. It's you can find this bird anywhere practically. Um, do do these these mud nests are they able to survive rainstorms or do they yes. fall apart in the rain? No, no, they survive. Wow, that's really cool. So my challenge is for anybody who thinks that well this isn't that impressive, try to make one yourself. Um, get some mud. And try to make a, uh, <laughs> a dome nest. Um, and you get to use all of your hands, all your fingers, um, your cool primate digits. And just realize that if you were doing it bird style, you just have to do it all with a pair of tweezers. Um, and, uh, and then see how, uh, how difficult it is uh, to, to do something like this. I know that number of birds who make mud nests like this have a kind of a cool trick that they do. When they take the mud mouthful and place it on the side of the, of the nest, they'll often just jiggle their beak, wiggle it a little bit. And what that does is liquefies some of the mud in that place. And when they stop the jiggling, it then hardens up. Um, and so that allows them to attach more little mouthfuls into this matrix. Um, don't know if this species does it, but many mud nesting birds will use this trick. Um, liquefaction is the same thing that makes um, a, a house that's built on sand um, uh, or, or, or sort of wet silt uh, drop into the, the substrate if there's an earthquake. Um, it turns the water, the ground to jelly, and then the house slips through. But the minute it stops, it hardens up again. So you're using that liquefaction trick to uh, to do these. I don't know if this bird is one of those, but could very well be. This is just such a cool nest structure. You gave us a yeah. high resolution photograph of this bird. That's now we get to really see the, 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 the plumage. What do you particularly like about the way this bird looks? I, well, it's funny to see the bird walk because it walks like a pigeon. So you see the neck go like this. <laughs> and it's, I think it's fun. I like a lot the, the color. It's, uh, the tail is like an orange. Uh, and well, it sings like uh, when it sings really hard. It's like ka, 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 ka. Uh, 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 well, I can. If I sing, it would be the national bird of Argentina. It's like, but why do you like it? Uh, I don't know. I simply like. It. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Would you like me to show some tricks on drawing this bird? Is is that all right, uh, Guile? I am going to move our little bird friend over here just a little bit so that on the right hand side of the page I can show you some tricks about um, sketching this this beautiful this beautiful bird um, when I would go about uh, hold on I'm gonna move uh, change my microphone so that I'm more easily heard when I'm in this other location all right um, so audio check uh, Avea can I still be heard easily I can hear you, yes. Great. All right, so if I were sketching this, what I would do is I would start with just this angle along the back of the head and the back. So this negative shape um, is a really useful way to start your bird illustrations. I'm putting in a little ball for the head. 
that are, is going to roughly tell me um, the, the sort of the proportions of the head. If this were a small headed bird, this were a large headed bird, these proportions would be different. So I'm thinking about how big is this head and just putting in a kind of a light ball there. Then what I do is I look at the negative shape on the front of this bird, just these first few little angles here. So it's coming back down from the beak, then straight down, and there's an inflection point here. It turns and cuts back like this. So I'll cut in a few of these little angles on the front of the face, and then tuck in the mass of the body of the bird behind this little catcher and this little catcher. So here I'm really also looking back and forth at how big is the head, how big is the body, how big is the head, how big is the body. I can make this head bigger. I mean, the body bigger. I could make this body smaller. But I've got this little kind of catcher here, which is going to get the neck and the, the body kind of connecting with each other. Now just sort of putting in a little ball saying, oh, you're, you're roughly going to be about this big. Be aware that most people have a tendency to make their heads too big because heads are really interesting on birds. A few other little details here. Tail, I'm going to stick in here up, as, just as initially as a little line with some undertail coverts. I'll also put in a little line in here uh, where the, the beak is pointing. And I also like to notice where in here does the wing start? How far out? How far out and where up and down? Because the wing can be held in lots of different positions. But here I'm sort of seeing it starting about here, and then it's going out over the tail. So this little guideline here is going to be useful. That means that most of the wing is going to be happening roughly in this zone. So this used to be kind of my initial sketch that I would make. And then I would get, I would switch my pencils and I would start to draw a lot more details on top of that. When I was in my most recent trip to Africa and Ecuador, um, I modified my approach to drawing. I was doing most of my drawing with a rather unforgiving ballpoint pen. And what I started doing is to to block in just a little bit more information before I switched over to my pen. So if you've sketched with me before, what you usually have seen me do is get something that looks about <coughs> like this. <laughs> Excuse me. And then I would switch pens and start drawing on top of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Today you're going to see something a little bit different. Um, what I'm going to do is actually add a little bit more information into my, my purple pencil drawing. Um, so I'm going to kind of block in my beak a little bit more. Um, I'm putting in now how far back the eye is. The eye is usually on the same sort of level as the beak. We want to leave enough space here between the eye and the beak. Um, so I'm now placing my eye. You also see a very, very nice... Um, ear patch on this bird. So kind of going back here from the eye, swinging down along the corner of the cheek. Um, and I used to kind of make my ear patches then just going straight up to the corner of the mouth. And how what I'm doing is I'm curving the bottom of the ear patch underneath the beak like that. And then coming down, you can actually see that angle very nicely on this auto. Um, so I'm blocking in my sort of parts of my, my head here a little bit more than I used to. Um, similarly, I'm going to check to see, does this have enough room for sort of eyebrow zone? The forehead angle is nice to kind of get. So you notice that this is, this is more information than I usually used to be putting on my, my bird drawings. My head is then in this area, and it looks like I want to make this connection between the head and the body a little bit broader. So that's a nice thing here. I am able to modify these lines just a little bit. In this area here, 
I have my scapular feathers, my back feathers. Down below that, my covert feathers of my uh, of the wing. Um, the edge of the breast here, and I'm seeing a little kind of triangle here, kind of going out for my my wing. So I'm just putting here's my wing primaries placeholder, or secondary, sorry, secondaries, and then my primary seem to be cutting underneath this. Bit. I'm going to back up a little bit and see if how if this bird really has. Yeah, it doesn't seem to have a lot of primaries sticking out there. Oh, here's that, that strut that you were talking about. <laughs> the foot up. Uh, I like the way this bird walks. All right. Um, so you notice here, I'm just kind of I'm giving myself yeah, sort of more of a preliminary drawing than I, than, I, than I tended to do in the past. And I'm finding that... Uh, relaxing to do. I'm enjoying doing that. So it's, it's just fun. But look at how long is this harsis. So I've got this, this bird. It's got enough of the chunky tummy in here. And I can now, I'm going to draw on top of this. And um, this, I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying my process of Look at, look at the, the size of its eye. I have kind of a robin proportioned eye. This bird over here has a much bigger eye, doesn't it? Oh, see, that's a proportion thing. The great thing about kind of something like this is that I've drawn a lot of robins, and so maybe these robin proportions are kind of jumping into my head. It's funny to turn this bird into the robin. But if I get a little bit more down here on my paper, I'm able to notice that, like, oh, no, it's not like that. Let's make this bigger. And now it's just starting to look a little bit more, a little bit more like this cool bird. I'm going to throw in some other angles here. There's a little angle here on the back of the head. It's feeling better. See, the start of the drawing with these purple pencil lines or light blue pencil lines, non photo blue pencil lines, you can move these around very, very easily. And um, that helps you. Um, you can get something on paper and then look, is that right? Don't look to make sure that you got it right, because sometimes if we just check, check to see did we get it right, the brain will say, yes, it's fine. But sometimes I'll look and say, like, what is, what's off? What's off here? Now, I'm going to draw in more heavy lines here. I thought this is uh, some 2B lead in this mechanical pencil. And got a little eye shape. I'm giving it a little bit of an eye ring here. Um, then this, this ear patch, it's really cool. You can see some of the texture of the feathers across it here. These are sort of stiff, more bristly feathers so that this bird's, uh, it doesn't kind of, uh, muffle the sound that can come in over the bird's ear opening. And this is a neat little zone in here. Look at this triangle in front of the eye. That area is called the lores in birds. And on this bird, it really kind of gives it this serious look, right? Um, I, this, this, this bird is looking like it is, it's not messing around today. Um, and part of that is this, these, these lores that kind of, kind of kick up in here and they connect the beak with the head. The line of the mouth comes here and then bends down. So that means that our lower bill
I'm seeing a little bit of a faint line in here where the malar zone is. So on this birdie right over here, that malar is right in here. And then we're going to have our feathers on the throat come out. And look at this, as I come down here, I'm not just gonna make a hard line like this. I'm going to flick some of these little lines in, which just makes this bit of the throat feel a little bit fluffier. Up in here, this area of the bird's chest can take lots of different shapes. Um, sometimes the wing overlaps over these, and sometimes the breasts over, feathers overlap the wing. Here, what we're seeing is a number of feathers of this bird, its breast feathers, overlapping the, um, the front part of the wing. So that's why there are these little kind of fluffy marks in here. This bird, when it landed, probably the wing was up on top of these feathers, and the more that's been walking around, then these feathers kind of plop over. Let's suggest our scapular feathers, and here this big bump. You can see a hint of that in there. And then this sound down here, those are our covert feathers, the secondary covert feathers. And they are I'm, I'm, I'm trying to avoid drawing the edges of those in with lines that are too harsh and too hard. Um, the, uh, yes, there are these little feathers in here, but if you make the edges of these too hard, it'll feel like there's kind of this zip, this, this, this pr these prison bars across here. Um, and the same is true on the back of the bird here. You've got these tertial feathers coming down. And then you've got secondary feathers. I'm going to put in just a hint of a few little feather edges. The primary is then tucking in like this. Boy, this is, you've got a nice looking bird for your national bird. The feathers here on this lower part of the flanks, these are often loose and fluffy, so I often will kind of just suggest that these are a little bit fluffier down. Well, that nice hind claw. And I'm seeing a little bit of evidence of some scales going up here. The rest of the foot is hidden from me. So I'm now just going to do a couple of quick things, and then we'll uh, introduce you to our next bird of Argentina. Um, where is, aha, here it is. So watch this. This is going to be kind of a, a fun, quick sketching technique. Um, I'm going to just squint at it and go like, wow, your eye is really dark. So I'm going to leave a little bit of a highlight in here, put some darker dark in the eye. Um, and squint at it and just sort of say to yourself, where is there, where is there uh, just a little bit more more shadow. I'm seeing a little bit of shadow under here. And this part of the bird. So I'm just using my, my, my pencil rather lightly and I'm getting and that shadow kind of comes up in here. So notice that this this little there's a little bump of feathers out here and this shadow kind of cuts up underneath it. Like that. Now, I'm going to have some fun. Check this out. This tool is a blending tool, and it can smudge things. And when you smudge things, it will make things darker. So I'm going to punch in these dark values right down here. 
I'm going to punch in just a little bit here. I'm going to give myself a little bit here. Right. And now I have picked up some graphite on the tip of this. And look what I'm going to do with that. I'm going to just sort of use it like it's watercolor. Like it's watercolor paint. And I'm going to bring some of that in here, some of that in here. I'm going to leave some part unsmudged. So think of your values as the place where you put graphite in, the white of the paper, and the area there where you smudged. And I want to leave some light on the back of this bird. Um, I want to leave some light on the back of this bird to be the where the sun is hitting. And there's a tendency to over smudge this. Right? So don't over smudge it. Well, there's a little more. I'm just going to leave this one as a graphite pencil drawing, but I had a lot of fun with my smudger. Remember, again, with your smudger, you've got an area that you um, that you have put your graphite down on. And if you smudge that, notice how that is darker than that. Then you also have area where you can smudge and um, area where you smudge and the uh, you're just using that kind of like a watercolor brush. And finally, you have area of just white paper. So notice I didn't smudge down into this part here, just to give us a little bit of reflective light on the bottom of the belly. Beautiful bird. Gal, you're ready for bird number two? Yes, yes I am. All right, let's talk about this bird. Yes. Tell us about a little bit well, about the, 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 the Swainson's hawk and why this is such a cool bird. Well, I think this is a cool bird because um, it, it's found in a lot of places here. Well, when I mean in a lot of places is that in Argentina and in the United States and other in Mexico and other places, but it connects uh, the, the both countries, uh, bird watching, we could say, uh, mm -hmm. because, uh, well, it's cool. you can find it where you live in the United States and here in Argentina. So that's a very cool thing. Uh, and um, this bird, uh, here where I live in Argentina, uh, it's found in the countryside of uh, it, it eats uh, something like mice and well, I think those type of, of animals. Um, and, well, uh, this is a very cool bird because it has lots of colors, so that's what I like a lot. And it has something that it's called more, uh, that it's like a bird has other versions of himself, but with other color. So, in the left, we have a juvenile, in the left, left. In the middle, we have a light morph. Uh, and in the right, we have the dark morph. The cool thing is that you can see all the colors and they are just one species. So, that's amazing. Yeah. 
It's so weird that, you know, these can all be in the same nest together. And some people, when they see morph, they think, yes. oh, that means that this one turns into this. But no, you're going to be like this for your, your, your entire life. But you can get both of these out of the same yes. clutch of eggs. Yes. Hmm. Really pointed wingtips. Um, I thought it was this this little point that you made here about how these in winter time most of the um, most of the uh, Swainson's hawks in the world will come down here to Argentina. So they all pack into this one little area, and then. To breed, they fly all the way back up here and they disperse out over the country and then whoop, then back again. There's a few yeah. that they've discovered that will actually winter <laughs> in um, over here in California. Um, in the Central Valley, there's a few uh, Swainson's hawks that didn't get the memo about flying south. But almost all of the Swainson's hawks come in here. So this part of the habitat, and if you're interested in Swainson's hawks conser conservation, it really helps you think about the importance of, of working together in partnership with other countries to be able to preserve this species. Yes. You're mentioning about the small prey is really interesting. These ones will also eat a bunch of insects. Um, so tiny prey. Yeah. So, we think of these things like, you know, like, oh, you're going to get rabbits. No, if you're a Swainson's hawk, you can, you're just chowing on all sorts of small things. There's actually part of the migration, the Swainson's hawks will sometimes pile into part of the southern United States. And they'll walk around on the ground eating grasshoppers and bugs and caterpillars. Um, <laughs> you don't expect a, 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 a hawk to be behaving that way. But they're really, really cool. Wow, I didn't know. That must be interesting to watch. Yeah, yep. Should should we do a little workshop on drawing Swainsons? Mm, well, I think that would be cool. Great. All right. Let's take a look at this one here in flight. We're going to use that, this light morph adult. Um, notice that the wingtips of Swainson's hawks are really, really pointed and narrow. So that's kind of a, a, a different look than you'll have with a, a red-tailed hawk, which is another common uh, video that we have up here. Um, so often very, very pointed uh, wings. This is going to actually help you draw lots of different hawks. When you're looking at the wing here, um, the way that I think of it is let me see um so i uh, yeah. the way i think of it is that this part out here on the tip of the wing is that this is where the bird's hand is and if you look all these feathers here they are fan they're coming fanning in towards that hand. So think of the tip of the wing as kind of a triangle, but with a fan out there. These few feathers here, this one, this one, and this one, we can kind of see this, this fingering. Let's go back up. Oh, I, I can't while well, I've got this. Um, so yeah, oh, actually, yeah. Take a look here. You can see just you can see in the tip of this here. You see one, two, three, four fingers. One, two, three, four fingers. We see just a few fingers out here. The rest of them though aren't doing that fingering thing. So what you're getting in the wing tip in this little triangle out here is is these ones out here in this part of the wedge. Those ones are going to be your ones where, that are doing fingering. You have a small one. Actually, let's change color here. Um, there we go. So you often get a small one, then bigger, bigger, 
smaller. So you see how um, I can have a couple of big ones out here. And then out here in the rest of this, these feathers are going this way, but they're not, they're not fingering. So you've got this fingering part in the outer tip of the wing. This part in here, these feathers are called the secondary feathers, and they're just coming straight back like this. And then the front part of the wing is covered with these covered up with these white feathers called coverts. Right? So if I am going to clear once. Um, if I am going to sketch this critter, um, that little insight about the wing is going to really help me be able to do this. There you see like there's up, these, for, I'm getting, I'm seeing the fingering here. These are still primary feathers, but I'm not seeing that fingering. Interesting. All right. <clears throat> so what are we going to do? Yeah. We are going to, we see that little Swainson top zipping around above us. And I'll often start a, a bird in flight sketch with a little cross like that. And what that's doing is it's giving me, um, but here is, here's my body. And here are my wings going across. There's going to be an outer part that is secondaries. There is an inner part, I mean, sorry, an outer part that is primaries, an inner part that is secondaries. And I'm going to give this bird both of those. So this is kind of interesting. Um, notice that these birds here look like they have longer wings than this one. Longer wings, shorter wings, longer wings, shorter wings, longer wings, shorter wings. What's going on with that? Ooh, well, glad you asked. This bird actually is doing this. Swainson's hawks have a dihedral. So when they hold their wings down a little bit more, you can see this as a longer wing, but they'll often fly with their wings up like a turkey vulture. And if you're looking at that from below, the wing is shorter. So, I'm going to shorten my wings here to make this one have the flying of a little bit of dahedral. It's got some tail sticking down like that. It's got some head sticking up here like that. Um, all right. So on this part of the wing, sometimes there's a little bit of a curve in. You get up to where the hand is. There's a little flat platform there. So we're going to tuck in, go up to a little hand. And then you're going to small feather, bigger feather, big feather, small feather, big feather, big feather, big feather. So you see what I did there? I've got this fingering only out here. And then your this part is covered up with your covert feathers. There's covert feathers that cover up the top, the front of the primaries. And then there's a wedge that comes down and covers up the secondaries. And you can also see little armpit feathers in here on this hood. It's undertail coverts come in here. And the tail can be held straight, the tail can be held slightly out like this, or the tail can fan like this. So same bird, right? And notice that the, on the fanned tail, it's not fanning from here. So there's not this big space here. It's fanning from here. So 
think of these feathers are going to be from a point in here. Kind of imagine your feathers pointing that way. That gets my nice little arch of 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 of. of. This one's looking to the side a little bit. I'll have a curved side and a flat side of the head if it's looking out in one direction. And then the tail, the, the sorry, the, the the feet, just kind of they they occupy a little space right in here. Be tucked up right underneath there. Now I'm going to show you a quick sketching tool that is really fun. And um, if you are, are are drawing, and sometimes you know you're you're, you're feeling you're, you're wanting to get a lot of information down quickly, here is a great way to do that. Um, I have just a quick sketch here. And now I've got two pens. These are Tombow brush pens. And they have a big side, and they have a little side. And check this out. I'm going to take, I've got a dark one, and I have a light one. Dark light. I'm going to start with my light one. And I am going to say, all right, this part in here is going to be... Value, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, uh, here, uh, this, oh, oh let's, 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 let's uh, give you, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to, rather than think about the patterns that are on this, I'm thinking where the light is striking. Um, so I've got a little bit of sunlight along the leading edge here, and I've got a little bit that is coming down on the side of that face here. I'm going to actually turn the rest of this all dark. Now I'm going to get this other one, the other pencil, another Tombow brush pen, and I am going to put in where the real darks are. It was dark along the edge of the wing, and then Darks. Oh man, that 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 wing is. That, I'm gonna I'm gonna make that one. Gonna do the same thing here. Oop, 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 oop. And I'm gonna have a lighter. But really, dark. And then there's dark. So with this broad pen, you can. You can get, it forces you just to have a, a, a minimalistic um, Hey Jack, um, we've got um, a couple of questions. Oh, one, one is, um, there's a request if we could please scroll back to the main photo, the one that you're drawing from, I think it is. Oh, um, actually, actually I, I was looking at these ones while I was drawing, but let's go oh. to this one here. Okay. <clears throat> Um, and then the other thing was, what's the second uh, shade that you're using of the Tombow, the darker one? I'm, I'm guessing the first one's an N95, but what's um, the second? This other one, they are so worn and used that I can no longer see what that is. Yeah, the light one I think is an N95, and the darker one, um, I am afraid I don't know. And Chadwick is is wondering maybe an N sixty five or or Linda Napier saying maybe N seventy five. I totally hear that. Um, nowadays when I get new Tombos, I put tape over the <laughs> over the part because they wear so easily um, with the with the names. Totally hear that. So there is just a, a quick. If I want some parts to get darker, like on these wingtips, you just give a second coat of that Tombow, 
And just like very, very quickly, you get a, um, it, the Tombow forces you to, because of this limited value range, you can do stuff really, really quickly. And that's fine. I want to make it belly just a little bit. So, I mean, look, look at that. You can get, here's Tombow and Tombow. And let's just go over both of those. Here's the darker with two coats over the dark. And here is this lighter one with two coats over that. So, look at all that, that value range. You get out of two pens. Wow. That's great. So, that is a quick look at our, these are called neotropical migrants. Neotropical migrants meaning that a migrant between uh, North America and the tropics. And um, so the Swainson's Hawk, a great addition to our little story here. And we have one more little special treat for you, everybody. Ready for this next one? Let's take a look. Oh, I mean, you, you've got me at the name. The Many-Colored Rush Tyrant. Aren't you curious? You want to tell us about this bird, Gal? Ooh. Yes. Ooh. It's not an easy bird to find. Um, oh. It's very fast. Uh, it, it lives in places uh, similar to swarms. Here in Argentina, we call them machinists. Um, if you try to drive in the moment while it's moving, it's almost impossible because it's very, very fast. So you got your head down to your paper, you got your head up again to watch, and it's gone all the way. Mm. Uh, but but uh, it's uh I chose this bird because it's very colorful. It's beautiful practically. Um and well it's it's a bird that I like a lot. And I would say almost one of the most precious, most colorful birds in Argentina. Um in my opinion of all the colorful birds, this is the most beautiful. Well, because, well, I don't know, but I, I love it. I love it. I love it. That is such a stunning little bird. Oh. So, and you're saying that, that because it's so active and these, it has these really complex patterns, that makes it a real challenge for you to draw. Yes, it's a big challenge if you want to draw this bird in the moment. Uh, but, well, it's if you try, you, you can do it. But if you don't, well, no. But in the moment, it's very hard to spot even because it's practically a lightning. It's very fast. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, one really useful strategy on a bird like this with really complex patterns, and especially if it's going to be moving around, it's not going to be sitting on a perch and cooperating for you, um, is to, when it pops up in front of you, is just to start to say out loud whatever you see. Um, you know, so I would, might be saying, all right, so black cap, uh, yellow bars uh, high above the the eye, big blue triangle on the side of the face, big blue triangle, um, pale iris, white, um, white throat that then very quickly uh, at the edge of a white bar changes to yellow that goes over across the whole breast. There's a big black stripe. And so, so, um, see, what I'm doing is I'm saying out loud, uh, yellow green on the nape, and then the back rest of the back is, is, is black. The, the covert feathers are white, and then uh, the edge of the upper secondaries, same thing, making a big white bar all the way along the edge of the green. Ooh, that's so cool, right? So you say out loud whatever it is that you see. 
And then that makes your memory much better for what you are, are looking at. Now look at that big angular black bar, flat in the front, really thick, not tapering, not tapering, kind of straight down there, reddish on the rump, looks like some white outer tail feathers, short tail, big head. It's just say out loud whatever it is that you see. And that, by the way, folks, this doesn't work if you, um, if you just think it in your head. You actually have to say this out loud. And that is, that's a big part of the trick of getting what's called the production effect to help you hold this. Look at that purple iris. So light. Ah, um, <clears throat> long, narrow bill jumbo head that golden ape wow right so um and as you're doing this the more expressive you are with what you say the better off you're going to be like if you go like like big blue triangle on the side of the head that's better than big blue triangle on the side of the head right um, because what you're doing is you're trying to get your brain to emphasize something like, oh weird there's a little dark triangle right in front of the red upper tail coverts wow white vent right so whatever you if you see something say something if you see something say something say out loud whatever you see on this bird and that will lock those details into your memory much 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 better look at how close to the top this yellow bar is I mean, it's not like a golden crown sparrow, which I'm used to. I mean, this is way up high, super high, right? So, you know, notice I'm going like, whoa, I mean, that's really high. That's helping me remember that that's really high. And then it's black below that. Ah, whew, that's so cool. So you see what I'm doing? I am, I'm talking to the bird. And the more expressive I am with that, the more those sorts of details are going to lock into my brain. Then the bird flies away. Now what do you do? Well, you have been talking out loud to this bird. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna block my view of it. I can't see that bird anymore. But let's just see, because I was talking out loud to that bird, what is in my visual memory, right? So now I'm gonna do a memory drawing of this bird with this complex pattern, right? So um, it had a really, really big head, really big head, and and then there's a little body on that. So I want to make sure that that head is 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 big enough. Fairly short tail, the wing was up here on its back, um, and let's see. So there's a big triangle of blue. There was white underneath that, and then yellow going up in here. Then the, there's a yellow bar up here, but the yellow bar was really high. Really high on that thing. Really Y in there. And put a B in here, and put a white in here, and put a Y in here, just to help me remember. Oh, and then there's that I with that pale blue iris. Uh -huh. That was cool. Nate was, was golden, and then green down below that. And then there's that white bar that went across here and down, and then the rest of this was black. We had some red here, little black triangle here. And oh, and that there, there's, I almost forgot that. How could you forget that big, thick bar? Big, angular bar. And... Well, maybe I want this head to be a little bit larger. Oh, okay. So, um, on this bird, I'm going to draw it with a ballpoint pen. So I've got a little ballpoint pen here. Um, and it, oh, it's not. Right, so, I can here. Is that I have to leave 
his eyeball pale. And I'm going to have a thin yellow stripe way up here. And then it's black above that. But there's black below that, remember? So that this area here was also all black. And then that, that came down to this big blue zone. And then there's a little white one here. Black down here. There's black in the wings. Maybe a little bit of black on the top of that. Oh, and there's that little triangle of black that was down here in front of the little red knee that was sticking out. And we had black on the top of the tail, but we had this white outer tail feather. So you see, my, I'm able to get a little bit of, a, 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 I, I, what I saw sticks in my head because I was doing all that talking to the bird. Yeah, so when the bird pops up in front of you, Take advantage of that and draw and draw the bird and, and look at the bird, right? When the bird is saying, look, hey, here I am. I'm a bird. I'm going to go, wow, you're so cool. You're a bird. Let's look at you. And I'm not, I'm not looking down at my paper and then the bird flies away and I don't know what I was looking at. And then there's more of a greener back than here. That feels too greeny. I'm going to lighten that a little bit. I need to suck. Um, and then there's that weird kind of blue, blue side of your face. And it went yellow up here in the middle. I put this yellow in, I'm going to put black around it, but I want to make sure that that is nice and dry um, when I do. That production effect is really, really useful. What color is it? Um, so you want to talk to the bird. You want to talk to the bird, and that is going to help whatever you see stick in your you're, you're building up this visual memory of, of what you're seeing and then a little bit of lilac color in the eyelids let's go a little bit darker with this make that eye pop out a little bit more That is an approach to drawing things that, things, especially things that are going to be moving. And when you do this, there will be things that are wrong. And that's okay. Let me say that again. That's okay. This isn't a field guide. This is your field sketch. And it is all right if there is something that you've observed and you remember that there is some red somewhere near the back and you put it in and it's not in the right place. That's going to be, it's okay. Um, um, 
let's jump over to this and see what that bird looked like. All right, so the yellow in the top goes much further down than I had it. That's interesting. So much further back there. Um, maybe, yeah, that, 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 um, and maybe a little bit more gold color in the nape. And the green color that I had, that wasn't right. And the green actually extends onto the upper tail coverts there. I didn't see that. Um, I've got a different color of red. This is much more of an orangey red. And I have a different color of yellow. So this is much more of an orangey yellow in here. Um, so the next time you get to see the bird, what you can do is you can compare what you see with what you do. And that then helps you on the next iteration get it even closer. So step by step, you're getting closer and closer to an understanding of what's going on on that bird. I also have too big a beak. This has a more delicate little beak. Interesting. So, um, but because I made marks, because I put marks down on paper, my brain um, is going to record more. Oh, look, this goes white. I had yellow all the way up here, but actually that's white there, right? So what you want to do is to, it's okay to have things that you, um, you, you do be wrong. And so it should, what I can do is then go, um, this should be white. Um, bigger, uh, smaller, um, more orangey, um, warmer, yellow, um, and, <clears throat> um, more gold. Okay. So you see, this is, it's a learning experience for me. I made some mistakes, but what I've done is I've just turned each of those mistakes into an opportunity to learn something. Instead of like, oh no, I got it wrong. No, it's an opportunity to learn. And um, that, that can help you handle these, these beautiful, beautiful birds. So that is um, a look at some of the amazing birds of um, Argentina. And um, let me see. Oops. One moment. All right, so there's the amazing birds of Argentina. Um, and um, I want to um, thank my special um, guest and resident expert on um, biodiversity of Argentina and uh, the, the master of our slideshow today. Thank you so much for putting together that very useful slideshow. Gail, it was wonderful to celebrate some of these birds with you. Yes, I've really enjoyed it. The, um, so we are now both available for questions um, from the community here. If anybody has um, questions about some of these birds or um, any uh, comments or thoughts that you would like to share with um, Guile, um, the, uh, then a moment, then we will um, will allow you to, to to speak, and we can unmute you. Um, uh, does anybody have any comments, um, thoughts, questions, um, or things to to share? If so, you can raise your hand manually, and I will look at the gallery view to try to spot you. Um, also, you can use the raise hand function um, in our in our Zoom.
right? And not seeing any questions directly about that, um, we can then move to a portion of our, our show where um, we're able to see what's been going on in your journals. Before we do, um, Gail, are there any pages from your journal um, and adventures uh, journaling in Argentina that you wanted to share with us? Um, yeah, uh, I will show you some pages. I want to say, um, in the winter vacation, because here in Argentina it's winter, um, I was skiing all the time, so I could, I didn't have much time to, uh, to the nature, uh, to the nature journal, but I watched a lot of things with my eyes, a lot of birds, and well, I do have some pages to show from the summer, but if you want to see them. We would love to. Well, uh, we've currently lost our... Um, our, 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 our camera view of what you're showing. Can you still hear me? Yes, I was looking oh. for my journal. Ah, there we go. Hmm. Hmm. I will look and see what I can show you. Well, I have some plants uh, here. Oh, my. I have. They are very light, so it's hard to see because I did very softly. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm having a... Oh, wait, wait, there's something starting to come into focus. Yes, it is very hard to see. Um, I'm afraid um, that it's not dark enough for it to really register on the camera. Um, I, but I, I like that you are birds. doing botanical studies in addition to, in addition to birds. Um, the... Uh, it is it's it's neat to um that yeah I, I like that you don't have tunnel vision just on birds but you also are enjoying uh studying plants yes i like it because sometimes when you can draw birds because well you didn't have much time to do the sketch you go and draw for some time a plant and well that here i have some sketches of birds from when I went to my uh, my aunt and uh, mm, house, uh, and well, it wasn't in Buenos Aires, a place more in the north of Argentina, and I saw. Let's see, some of these birds. Well, wait a minute. Well, I also did it lightly. <laughs> yeah, we can. I can but, see the eyes uh, and a little bit of the posture. Um, you're making your bird drawings large enough to be able to really include details of of what you see, which is a very useful strategy. Yes, because just well this part in particular um it's called Bihui Frente Gris um is is hard to sketch uh because it's very it's very fast. So I first started with lots of writings and then when I spotted it well I I couldn't sketch it in the moment because well it was that's how it vocalizes. Um, and uh, well, it disappeared. So I had to look a uh, picture from Eber. Uh, that's, and well, I dropped. But I, I wrote down the things that I heard in the moment and that I, well, experienced. Oh, we'd love to see.
and let's see. Hmm. I'm looking. Well, here I'm. I think your camera is frozen. Oh. If you can oh, see oh, it. hey. You're... I was texting. And... Oh, this is, these are really great studies that um, I'm really excited about that seabird where the uh, wing is really foreshortened. Um, that is such a challenging angle to do. Um, very, very, very effective there. That's really cool. Thank you. Hmm. And in this journal, I don't have, well, actually, I have a lot of things. I have the moon. Uh, wait, wait, oh, well, give us that moon one more time. That's really fun. So this is... So moon observations, um, and also noticing where you're seeing the the seas on the moon. Yes, and the oh, the cliff that was a few a few months months ago, uh, where well, the moon was practically in a reddish. Orangish color, and well, that's it. Great. Oh, well, thank you so much for sharing uh, some of your observations from Argentina with us. Um, it was a delight to have you with us today. Um, well, let, let's hear from some other folks in the community about things that have been happening in their journals. Um, we're going to start with Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hi there. <laughs> we had a compliment for you. <clears throat> you say hi. You getting shy? What was it? Give what were you going to tell him? Give him a say. I like your um your writing with the birds. Oh, where, where we put the little notes in to change things? Yeah. It, it's your such a useful tool. Then the drawing doesn't have to do all the heavy work of carrying all the information. Uh, I really recommend that you also feel free to draw on your pictures. So we're just getting I mean, sorry, started. To, to, to write on your pictures. <laughs> we're using your book to, with our homeschool group to go out and make your journal and use the lessons in your book to help us do that. So he's six and she's nine and we're just kind of getting started and we love it. It's great. Thank you. That's, that is so much fun. It's really nice to meet you. Um, and I'm delighted that you're, you're doing that with your family and with your homeschool group. Um, yep, we live in South Florida, so we're going to see totally different things than what you see. <laughs> oh, oh, so. oh man. Uh, do, are you going to, are there spoonbills or anhingas near you? Yeah, we yeah. see a lot of those. Yeah. <laughs> you see a lot of those? <laughs> yes. Oh, do you have any journal pages with any notes about those yet? No, we're. We're pretty new. We haven't done those yet. Uh, things in motion are going to be really hard for us right now, but we'll get there. <laughs> that is so cool. Um, yeah. You know, I would love to see um, any of those those sketches that you do or those any notes that you take about nature in Florida. Um, the uh, have have you ever seen a manatee? Mm hmm. Oh, let's see. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. so many cool things around you that you get to play with. That's great. Yeah. There's yeah. like a place um like here and it's and like the my, the manatees migrate here and so like there's like at least a hundred of them there like every year. Oh, it's um hold the phone. A hundred manatees hanging out in this area? Yeah. It's it's an energy plant, so there's a lot of it pumps a lot of warm water back into the intercoastal and, and so they, they like to really congregate cool. there in the winter. Mm. Yeah, it feels good. Right? And you, there's actually there's actually a dot cam that you can see any time of the day, any time of the year that there's they like will so show many. what which manatees are in that little lagoon area. Yeah, oh, that's pretty cool. cool. 
That is so cool. Well, um, we would love to see updates um, from your your journaling adventures. And thank you uh, also, for <laughs> yeah, And if there, as as you're out there, if you're thinking to yourself, like, you know what, I'm I'm struggling with this aspect of nature journaling. Let me know, and we can put together a class or two specifically about things that you're seeing that uh, you might be struggling with to show you some ideas and suggestions to help you be able to handle that. Wow, that would be amazing. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be back for sure. Thank you so Fantastic. much. Fantastic. Hey, it is really great to have you with us. So my, my name's Jack and you are? Elizabeth, Gabriel, oh. and Eva. Yeah. Elizabeth and Gabriel and Eva. Um, hold on. Liz and my dad is over. Oh, yes, and dad. <laughs> Gabriel and Eva. And you guys are in Florida. Yeah, we're in Palm Beach, Florida. Palm Beach. West. Well, um, Elizabeth, Gabriel, and Eva, I uh, wish you wonderful nature journaling adventures. I think you're going to find that when you head out with your nature journal, even species that you've seen before, you're going to notice all sorts of things about them that you have never noticed before. The process of journaling just helps us see so much more. Would you agree, Gal? Yeah. Yeah, we did your uh, video lesson number two on I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. We did it with like an apple, an orange, no, an apple, a lemon, and an onion yesterday. And we already started to notice some things that we never would have described using, you know, those things that we find in our house every day. So we can see it happening already. Oh, this is really exciting. Well, I'm really so uh, delighted to that you're now part of our community. We are too. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye-bye. Oh, wasn't that fun? Um, the, uh, um, let's jump over to London um, and join our friend Ray Bonto. Um, hey there. Um, well, you can now unmute. Hi. Hi um, there. How, how have you been? Very good. Um, hi, girl. So, um, I didn't have my watercolors at hand, so I was doing colored pencil. So, um, oh. here's the... Um, <clears throat> oh, nice work. Nice work. I like how you're um, sort of defining those, those, those outer primaries and then showing how they... Um, oh, is this watercolor pencil? No. Oh, okay. Um, I, I like um, that. I also like your really sort of bold lines, but really uh, terrific work on the um, uh, really terrific work on hand, the way you're kind of showing those, those, the fingering on those primaries. Uh, thanks. And here, here was the first one. Oh, oh, you really got those angles around the back of the head, also really solid. Look at that, Gail. What do you think about that for the honor of? That's really it's cool a, to see that. A very cool rhyme. It's, it's a very cool rhyme. Actually, it's very similar. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and that was a quick sketch of the, the yeah. last one. Oh, good job on the proportions. That large head, the angle on the back. Um, yeah, and, and you got your bill the right size. I gave mine a massive kind of a thrasher bill. Um, the uh, That uh, has really good proportions. Okay. Actually, you said that you all, most people make their heads bigger. I, I always make it smaller for some reason. Oh. Um, but if, if we know those things about ourselves, then we are much more able to catch it, right? And, um, and be able to correct it when we, uh, when we draw over it. Thank you so much for, for showing those. Thank you.
Oh man, that's really, really neat. Um, let's see. Um, jumping over to the, uh, calorie view here. Does, does, uh, oh, Hey, Jack. Good to see you. Missed you this summer. Uh, good to see you. Uh, hold on a second. Hey. Oh, there you go. Hey, um, I've done a lot of nature journaling, so I'm, this will be a little bit, but um, I'll try to be quick. So this was two days before my birthday. I was just doing a flower in our pond garden. Oh. The close-up of the, the, the stamens in there. I like that little arrow showing you um, how that little close-up of the stamen, you drop that into there. Details on the petal tips. You've got measurements. You're including the, the smell, words, pictures, numbers. This is really strong observation. And um, I know how you said to go down to cool rabbit holes for my birthday, and I did. Oh, so, oh okay, okay. So Bring from, it on. Bring um, it on. From our Brazilian jiu-jitsu um, gym, there's this guy that my mom knows, um, Mr. Why am I drawing a blank on his name? But he breeds snakes, ball pythons. And he brought like 13 of his snakes over our house. And we, we got to do some real cool nature journaling with that. Um, so I was just writing down. So in the moment, like when he was doing his presentation, I was just writing down lots of notes and just doing a couple of quick sketches. And they're called ball pythons because they um, curl up in a ball like that when yep. they, they're scared. And this was one that and almost looked like it was going to strike. Those studies of the pupil shape too. Yeah, I get. I mean, you you see those all scattered all over the page. Their eyes are so cool. You just can't stop drawing them. Yes. Oh, that is so neat. And yeah, the angles on snakes as they coiled, I find those so so challenging. And this way, you're um, sort of representing those shapes and those angles. Really, really solid. Oh, yes, so nice. And then you really get the end. sense of that neck kind of snaking back away from you. And then the That's next great. day, my mom took some pictures, so I did some more careful color drawings of those snakes. <gasps> and he, since he breeds snakes, there um he can like when he um because he when they're about to um come out of their eggs, he kind of cuts it open a little bit because they snakes have drowned in their own when they're trying to get out. Mm -hmm. If they have trouble, sometimes they can drown in their own egg. So yep. he kind of helps them out as they crawl out of there. And there are so many different color combinations in just a ball python, one species of snake. And his favorite that he brought over, a Trojan pie ball, is to so look at this crazy design. And then it's just white, just white. Like that is the Whoa. actual colors. Oh, wow. It was crazy. So like that... some color in some spot, creamy white in the other. That is Amazing. And look at that 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 uh, that head looking away from you. What a large eye. And nice use of your gel pen to suggest the, the small scales on the python skin too. Yeah, I was in that cross hatching. And then so that was super fun. And that is so cool. Uh, and you're also a, a BJJ guy. Yeah, yeah, I do. Although I can't really do it right now because, and somebody asked how my knee is. It's, it's definitely healing. I'm doing physical therapy off my crutches. Got, up, got off those a couple of weeks ago. I can bend it now. Um, still have my brace, but I can take it off when like right now I don't have it on. And it's, it's healing. That's, that's great. I'm, I'm glad to see that you are, you're getting better. And um yeah, I'm once uh, I'm I've been jonesing for uh, getting back into jujitsu, but for the pandemic, I have been I've been without my jujitsu for the the whole pandemic. I've been really you, missing it. You do jujitsu? Oh yeah, I am. Oh, that's so uh, cool! I did not know that. Yeah, that's so cool. It is then, so much much fun. We'll, we'll have to sometime uh, maybe in, in a different context. Let's 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 talk about that. I've I've been doing jujitsu for years. I'm a, a brown belt. Uh, wow. Do Carly Gracie in San Francisco. 
That's so cool. I did not know that. And then some more journal pages, um, some cowbirds, some quick sketches of the cowbirds. We have a oh. lot of cowbirds in our yard. Um, this one, this one is like a landing pose. Um, I was watching one come in and he only holds his pose for one second, but like they come in and then right before they land, they like spread out their wings, I guess, to stop themselves from coming in so fast. Oh, um, yeah. And look at the feeding, the feeding pose there. Nom, 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 nom. And then. This is so cool. You've been really busy with your journal. And then this was super creepy and super weird. So <laughs> I'm just Bring sitting it. at our picnic table outside and just kind of looking for bugs because there's so many bugs on this picnic table. It's weird. Um, then I see this thing. I'm like, oh, my gosh, is that a tick? Then I'm like, wait, what? Um, it looked like a cross between a tick and a scorpion. <gasps> it had a scotum like a tick, um, but also like attached to its head, scorpion like claws and arms. Oh, oh, yes, and yes, yes, yes. Yes, and after some research by my dad, we found out it was a pseudo scorpion. And yes, yeah, and I'd never seen this before. It's it um after some research by the pseudo scorpion, same family as ticks, spiders, and scorpions. Harmless but cool. Oh, pseudo! Yes. Oh, that is so much fun. That is so much fun, and your description of it is just perfect. Yeah, it's this. It's 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 when 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 tick meets scorpion doesn't have the big. Uh, I understand that they've actually got some uh, venom in their their pinchers. Really? Um, the. Uh, uh, so I, I should look more into that. That is so cool. And then a little, this was from a book. I just did a little sketch of a Bob White. Mm, super and, cute. Bird. Oh, yeah. I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget it. It happened June 26th, battle. So I'm just sitting. I, I also like to carve, carve animals. Um, I'll show you that in a second. But... Well, I'm just uh, outside uh, on our patio carving. So this is a little bit after my surgery. So I'm still um have my knee straight and stuff on crutches. So I'm just out on our patio carving and I hear um so there's all this is really weird, all these birds flying around, just tons of birds. Um yeah, evening sun was setting, but there was still plenty of light in the sky. I was at our little booster table and there was lots of bird activity, brown thrashers, cardinals, sparrows, and wrens were flying around. I was coming around and and then in our big tree over our, over the top of our house, I hear and I look up and like the branches are shaking in one spot. And then this huge owl bursts out of the tree right after it on hot in pursuit hook. They go up into the air. The oh. um the owl dives, the hawk keeps climbing and then dives, comes down hits the owl with its talons and then they both crash into the trees on the other side i see them land and then they fly off and the whole time it's screaming <laughs> the hawk it was crazy oh that is crazy that is insane yeah. that is what fun what a great description of that you know um you don't want to mess with a great horned owl they are such crazy predators but and it wasn't a great it wasn't a great horned owl. Oh, I, don't, was it? I only got a glimpse of it. I don't know what it was. I think it was a barn owl. I, th I think it was a barn owl. Wow. wow. Yeah. And then um, that was that was really cool. And then um, next, yeah, I did. And you, you sure don't want the, 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 the predatory owl in your neighborhood when you go to sleep, right? Because <laughs> when it wakes up to go hunting, if you're napping – you could be on the menu. I remember when um, they were doing some of these releases. Uh, they would, they would, they would have these these hack sites where they would raise peregrine falcons when they were really close to extinction, and then release them with little transmitters on them. They found that a bunch of uh, with the, these these radio transmitters, they discovered that a bunch of these um, peregrine falcons were just staying very still in one spot. And there, several of them were staying still in this one spot. And they went and uh, tracked with their little radio antennas where those, 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 those were. 
and found that underneath the great horned owl nest, there were these little radio transmitters that had come off of peregrine falcons that the great horned owl had killed. What? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, wow. You know, That's you crazy. may be a, you know, Top Gun, but when Top Gun goes to bed, you're rather still. Oh, um, and cool. then this is a little couple of weeks ago. Um, there's all these little like fungi, weird fungi. They're tiny, but I, I call I just named it Matrix Cannon. And like I don't know when they do it, but at some point they shoot up all these little like seeds or whatever. And they're really annoying. They get on the windows and you have to use your finger to get them off. But um, oh, these little things. This is really zoomed in. They're really tiny. They have all these pebble-like things inside them. Yeah. On the other, I pulled one out, and on the other side, it has this little thing that I wonder if that thing attaches to another one, and that, and then and that all that all those attach themselves inside, and then they explode when they need to. Oh, that is cool, and and what a great description of that. That's really yeah, fun. Found a cool feather. Um, yeah, Susan um, is suggesting that you um, do a little search for bird's nest fungus, and that might um, you might find some things kind of connecting to um, to 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 your your research there. Yeah, and speaking of fungus and bird's nests, I found which I was near brush. I'm, I don't know where hummingbirds nest, but it was very small. Like. This, the nest was like this big and I'm wondering if it was a hummingbird nest because it had very fine like rushes almost like um, grasses, dried grasses and lichen, lots of lichen. Um, mm. And this is actual size. I used the little um, compass to measure the radi radius and then made the exact same circle and then worked off of that. So oh, I was able work. to get the exact same size. And then um, I was out on a blanket during doing this and I saw there were two bald eagles by the pond down in, a, in the valley and they were just kind of hanging out. It was, that was really cool. Wow. Though that and is one, so much it fun. It was so funny at one point when they first landed all the geese in the pond every single, <laughs> goose, every single goose had their head turned towards the eagle like it was going to attack at any moment. It was so funny. And then this was the yeah. other day. Oh, that, that, that reminds me when I was in, in Africa. So you could sometimes figure out where the lions were by you look at where are all the zebras and antelope looking. So if, if all the herbivores are standing like this, right, <laughs> you, you, there's a good chance that you found a, 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 a lion. That's, that's so cool. All those geese oriented yeah. towards that bird. Um, and then this was a couple of days ago. Um, we have, for the first time, we were growing corn in our garden, and it's turning out really good. We, well, we've had a couple of deer attacks, so we built like a wall, and we're trying to see if, like, a, um, out of wire, and we're seeing if that's going to work, but I did, this was on corn silk, the silk that grows out of the corn ears. I didn't really have anything else to journal, so I was like, hmm, let's just see that. And then there was a great blue heron flyover. That was cool. Oh, really nice. big ones. Oh, that. That's cool to do. Also, the the the, the close up of the corn silk. Wow! Oh, it's actually, this is fun. It, it had little hairs, and when you like grab a big bunch of it, it almost has like a grippiness to it. So I'm wondering if that's what the hairs are for. And then um, I wasn't able to do that much journaling on it, but I'm gonna do another picture off of another painting off of a picture. So um, I don't really have that much on it, but we found a female Hercules beetle. <laughs> which we don't i've only seen that one other time in my life at our cousin's pool and that was a male which was even cooler because it had the horns but this was also a huge beetle at least three inches long and i only got to do its leg because then our friends our friends we had a play date and um they had just arrived but this was its leg um, wow oh nice labeling too yeah well, but wow i wonder do that. you think those are adapted for digging Nice yeah. uh, reflections and the reflected light on that uh, as well. So yeah, that was that was really cool. And then latest. And, and so just sort of note to everybody: 
if you can't draw the whole beetle, that's okay. You can still do just get a ton of really hardcore geeking out with just looking at the leg, right? And yeah. uh, so that's better than nothing. Right? And then this was yesterday. I'm gonna go on a whole spider web adventure. Um, I'm just gonna be. I'm just gonna study lots of spider webs and um, first sp web number one. Um, it was really, I found the spider actually, and it was like the size of a tick, it was really small. Um, and this spider web under my microscope, really cool. It looked like it was act is actually made up of lots of different strands, kind of all squished together, make one strand. And then this is it kind of bunched up. I'm wondering if he like made a mistake in his web and he had to kind of just mess it up and keep going. Um, well, something that, that might be going on with this is there's a group of spiders called comb footed spiders comb footed spiders and they actually will make their their webs for uh trapping prey um are they'll they'll have these these multiple strands and they have these comb on their foot for kind of fraying it out and it gets all tangling so you stick your little hairy insect foot through and it's like caught on all these little strands so rather than using glue the comb-footed spiders um, are are making uh, are, are are actually using these sort of complex structure of multiple strands. I That's wonder really cool. if that might be what's going on. Um, It'd be fun to get... draw the shape of the overall web. Yeah, and maybe zoom in on the spider friend. Yeah, because I don't know how big they get. Because this spider was like. The um, the size was a little bigger than the period at the, at the end of the sentence. It was really small. Um, it was on a lavender plant, and then that's um, then this today. All right. Yeah, there are our friends. There are our friends. You got your tombos out. Mm -hmm. Right. It's so just you... so fun to just um just do the shadows even. All the darks, it's like so satisfying to just put all the darks in, you know. Um, yeah, and then that's this, it for this coming Tuesday. I'm going to be going through the Galapagos Journal, and I did a bunch of Tombow drawings in that, um, where I just had two Dom Tombos, my my light value and my dark one, and with those was was able to really kind of get a lot of very satisfying um, shadows. Oh, so much fun to take a look through your journal. Um, and then, um, sorry to interrupt, but I had one more thing. Um, um, this September 18th, um, me and uh, my brother are sharing a booth at a craft show and I've been making lots of bird paintings and, um, little carvings. And this is some of the things that I carved this little guy, little owl. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Oh, I like the lean to it. Show us the, the profile view. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Inside view, you've also and also the, you, the the those those facial discs are slightly curved back. I knew you did um, you know carvings like this this one on the wall behind me here. Hold on, I need to silence this phone. I should have done that earlier. <laughs> ah, sorry about that. Um, so we've got that guy um, up there. Um, but I didn't know that you also did three dimensional. Yes, I, I just got into this. Um, actually, the day after I had my surgery, um, as a gift, I got um, a starter guide to whittling and some wood. Um, so I've been really into it since then. And I'll show you a couple of my paintings I've done for the crash show. It'll come and turn. Oh, let me. Um, uh, remove spotlight here. Yeah, here we go. Oh, yes. And then some flamingos in flight. Oh, I like the different wing angles. A little mallard. Ooh, oh, we've got the iridescence on that head going to dark there. Yeah, I tried. I've been having some trouble on the iridescence, so I just 
And I think it works just as well if you just do all black and then do some color pencil on top of it. Um, mm -hmm. This is a belt of kingfisher or a fish. <gasps> this is my favorite bird. And oh, then, that's so well, cool. Another common turn in flight. Um, so you're going to be selling these at the craft show? Yes. And then this is a Faro's gold melon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, what are you thinking of your price point for these different pictures? I still have to figure that out with my mom. Um, probably around $10, something like that. Um, this is another comment. I don't know why I did so many turns. I guess I just secretly like them for some reason. Yeah. And then a you know, woodpecker. Ooh. I did the um Wow. The Very. brush trick with the splaying. Yeah. Um, where you turn it. That that works really good for the hair. And then I don't know if I'm gonna sell it. I'm not too happy with it, but I was trying to um experiment with this black paper and kind of doing like the negative space and then the white colored pencil to pop. It looks a little eh, so I don't know if I'm gonna sell it, but this bald eagle. So like I cover in the white and try to do like the negative space here. Um, the oh, space the white and try that's to cool. So you're doing light against dark and dark against light. Yeah, it's a little wonky, but so I don't know if I'm gonna do that one, but then a little puffin. <laughs> Good job on the, 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 the slightly bow-legged shape on those legs. Ooh, this cormorant, cormorant okay. eyes, aren't they gorgeous? Yeah. Those oh, eyes are just, um, just so blue, and a lot of others, which I don't want to take up too much time. But yeah, it's going to be really fun. That's great. Um, so I've got a, a uh, so your your first one is actually already sold. Um, I want to buy the um, the kingfisher. Um, sure, I can. So uh, once can... so once you kind of figure out your price point for those, um, uh, th that one doesn't go out on the table. Oh, you can to, to show people it, but uh, that one's already spoken for. Yeah, I can, I can showcase it or something. I won't, I won't sell it, though. And whenever I send it to you, I also have, I still need to send it your little stylus I made a little while ago. Oh, fantastic. I would love that. So I'll put that on. Find that kingfisher. You've been really busy. Yeah. All right. Sold. Sold. Absolutely. <laughs> See, so, so yeah, they'll hold that one up again. So you check that out. The um, three quarter view angle of both the beak and the chest. Um, um, and uh, you, you're kind of showing the volume on the, the white part of the chest. Um, and that could be a really challenging thing to do. You're, you add too much shadow into the, the a white chest and then it turns gray, but this still really reads as a, as a white chest on the bird. Yeah, I did uh, some smudge, smudging here and then some tombow up here. Nice yeah. work. Strong work. I won't take up any more time, though. Uh, Jack, this is really exciting stuff. Really exciting stuff. Um, so uh, Susan Beckhart was um, uh, dropping in some comments into the chat about some of the observations that you uh, had. I'd love to bring her in on this conversation. Hey there, Susan. You can now unmute. There you go. Hey. Hi there. I'm not sure which which comments you were referring to, but uh, um, that this, that was really really fantastic work, and I'm agreeing with some other folks who are saying don't forget to sign your work. Yeah, I do. I do in the um. You got the, the, the bug in the corner. Oh, okay, okay. There you go. Good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> um, so on, on the one that you sent me, if you could move, because I'm going to put that in a frame, and that frame would cover up that signature so I also put it a, a yeah put another one somewhere up uh, adjacent to yeah. i also saw that you had developed a bug um a bug is what scientific illustrators call when we kind of have something where we like your jr where you kind of were playing doing something where you're kind of playing with your initials that were sort of formed together mm -hmm. there that's yeah. that's what uh, illustrators call a bug i saw that you also had have have a bug that's cool that's really cool because I've been trying. I've been trying for years to like figure out what to do with my initials. That's more interesting than just writing my initials out. And if, and if I'd known it was called a bug, I would have come. Out, I would have 
come up with something to answer. Yeah. Awesome. What, what, well, I had you, actually, actually, I asked you, could you hold up that feather again that you found, Jack? The, um, hold on. The one that was in your book? Yeah. Because I'm curious. Oh, my goodness. What a... Okay, that's a very that's interesting one. Really talking. cool because check this out. I did not save the actual feather. Oh, that's like the same feather. It sure looks like it. The pattern is not quite exactly the same, but boy, it looks similar. So I, I haven't put the label in. I, from my naturalist, it suggested that it was a kind of woodpecker, but I wasn't really sure that I trusted what kind of woodpecker. Oh, um, Sochi. Oh, yes, <laughs> I'm seeing the comments here. But yeah, so I, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, it was just sort of lying on the trail there. And uh, so trying to figure out. So and it so looks cool. the same size from the way you're holding it. I just, just, just uh, roughly, um, yeah. <laughs> so this, I basically sort of almost traced it to get the size. So mine, mine is life size, but yeah. So that's cool. We're gonna- That is so Maybe, maybe so the same fun. bird, maybe even the same individual bird if it flew very far. Yeah. <laughs> Coming up. And and what 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 locate what what states are you each in? New York, Maryland. All right. So <laughs> birds of a feather. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, I was I was gonna I was gonna hold off on on this, but I, I'll show show this. Um, uh, first of all, I finally got some other colors of wash, so I've been sort of playing with those. It's turned out a lot brighter than I planned, but but I'm on I'm on a quest. Um. Oh. That's fun. I'm on a quest to find the green heron because uh, last year there's this little there's this little trail, little waterway here. There's a little side trail you can take, and last year I kept seeing like, a couple times over the course of a few months a green heron hunting right in this area here, and I got I got a really good look at it. I got to watch it stalking the fish and everything. It was very cool. Took a bunch of photos. It was not nature journaling in quite the way that i am now and i thought this year i want to see if it's come back or if another one is, has showed up i don't know if it's the same bird or not um so earlier this year i like back in june and went and looked and i couldn't find one but twice now in two days i've been over there just recently and i saw it very briefly oh so fine. i was trying to sort of diagram where it had flown to and there may be more than one i don't know um, but then the second day that I came by, I did actually get a really clear look at it <gasps> um, for like two seconds. Yep. So uh, come yeah, to me, my there. beauty. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> what else are you going to say? It's a green hair and they're, they're awesome. Um, uh, they are so awesome. But yeah. So the thing is, the funny thing is last year, like there were it, two times that I was there. I was, the, this, this trail was like this little sort of, so it goes right along the water, but you're kind of above the water, and there's just enough of a screen of kind of bushes and branches and things that you can, you can, if you're careful, you can kind of be in a bit of a blind. And if you're quiet, you can, you can maybe sort of sneak up on it. But last year, the green heron that was there was just like totally chill. Like as long as I didn't make a loud noise, it would just keep doing what it was doing, and it was preening itself, and it was catching fish, mm. and doing all kinds of cool things. This this time, like the moment that I showed up, I, I basically I wasn't even making any noise that I could hear. But I, I get there and I and I hear a, a rah! noise that it makes and it flies off down the waterway. Then I got a little farther along and it did the same noise and it flew off more. So I'm pretty sure that I was disturbing it. So I don't want to disturb it too much, but I'm hoping maybe if I go in the morning, perhaps we'll, we'll see if I can get some some, some good looks. But um, yeah, so anyway, uh, I, I, my, my hope is that I will um, uh, like, you know, get, get some, a better look at it uh, and be able to try, try and do some, you know, field sketching of it. And if I can't get a better look at it, I'm go, we'll go back to the photos that I took from last year. I'll do some more sketching from those and probably do that anyway. But uh, yeah, that, that was, that's exciting. Um, but I, I wanted to show you something that wasn't actually well I'll just to show you. Um, we sort of restarted the the the, the rabbit hole. The oh, good. Something it can happen. 
Uh-oh. It, it's dangerous. <laughs> it's dangerous. So I'm going to try to like not go too long um, and not get too technical. But <clears throat> so back on the summer solstice, we were discussing this this whole project of putting a stick in the ground and then marking where the shadow of the stick is over the course of the day. Yes. Right. And I kept thinking, I kept thinking, like, okay, can I predict what's the shape that we're going to get from this? And I've been thinking about it, I'm thinking about it, and I just couldn't quite work it all out in my head. There's too many moving parts. And finally, right about midnight, that is like, you know, just after the, that day of the solstice, I sort of, it sort of crystallized and I sort of like figured out the model that was going to make sense to me that I think was going to work. Proceeded to sit here at this spot for three hours. That's until 3 a.m., folks, in case you're traveling. Um, just <laughs> like running, sort of running these movies in my head. And I couldn't even like really write it down because I, I was like so, such a tenuous grasp on it that I felt like if I, if I took the time to like figure out how to draw it, that I was going to lose it. And finally, I kind of got it set in my head enough. I did do some diagrams. But anyway, when we were discussing on, on Tuesday, when you were showing that again, I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. I need to really, like, write this up and, like, work out this whole thing. So I started trying to write it up, and it's, it, I'm considering this to be a, a draft, um, which is to say, I don't know if this is going to make any sense to anybody else. It, it, it just about barely makes sense to me. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to figure out if you do that, that experiment, so just so we're clear, so we're sticking a stick in the ground or on a piece of paper or whatever, and we are watching over the course of a day, where does the shadow of the, the tip of the shadow of the stick hit on the ground? And we trace that out and we should get some kind of a curve, maybe a line, whatever kind of shape it is, right? And so I said to you, when you showed that, I said, was that a hyperbola? And you said, yes. What I wanted to do is I wanted to figure out what shape of curve are we going to get on any day of the year at any latitude. Now I have many pieces of paper of trying to figure this out. Um, so, uh, so, so, I, so I, here's the thing. So, this, so what I've got to show, like I said, I don't know if it's going to really make any sense, but I decided let's let's show it now because it's fun to yeah. discuss. And because uh, if I don't show it now, it may never get shown. So, um, but I was thinking about this and I was sort of trying to figure out, here's the problem is, you know how I like to use a geocentric model of the solar system, whatever I can. Um, <laughs> and, and honestly, like this situation, unless you are considering the motion of the other planets, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, as far as the earth and the moon and the sun are concerned, the sun goes around the earth, that's fine. Because as the earth is rotating, or the sun's going around the earth, it's the same thing. It's going to give you the exact okay. same geometry and the positions of everything's the same. So it really can be. Here's the problem I was having is I kept like picturing that and drawing that with the sun being very small and close to the earth so that I can actually get it on the piece of paper. Right? And what I realized is this was really messing me up because the result is, is that if you're on different parts of the planet, you're looking in different directions to see the sun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sun is very, is very close to the earth. But so the sun is very far away. It's not at infinity, but it's convenient to say that it's at infinity. And then it becomes very hard to draw that. And for me, it became very hard to work out how to do that, keeping the earth as a fixed reference frame. Like then all of a sudden, you, it really is more natural to think of this, you know, the, the heliocentric model with the earth being very small and far away, but, you know, it works. But, um, I really need to have a sort of a fixed Earth for purposes of this question. So I finally worked out um, that I could think of the sun as a vector pointing in a certain direction. It's very far away. This is just like this, again. Here's what I'm going to say: is, is like I, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm not even going to try to like make this like totally make sense for everybody because I'm just about holding on to it in my head right now. Um, but the thing I will note is, is when we're talking about this kind of thing, what makes sense to any given person is going to depend on what their background knowledge and information is. And I have different background knowledge information than you do, than the next person, the next person, and so on. 
And for all that I'm a math teacher, I, it doesn't mean I'm always that great at like figuring out how to make that make sense for somebody else. So I've just about gotten it to make sense for myself. If it's not making sense to, to somebody else, like that's okay. That's, that's on me because I haven't quite figured out how to get there. <laughs> but I'm, so I'm going to try and be working here. But the point is, is that what, what, what I worked out is all about cones, which is very exciting because it turns out to be all about, for me, it's very, it turns to be all about planes intersecting cones. And uh, there, where there may be a very specific area of mathematics yeah. dealing with this. <laughs> it is, it's called conic sections. Yeah. And um, so when you have a cone, and the mathematicians think of a cone as being something that goes up like this, and also down like this, just because mathematically it's easier to describe that having both of those. Um, and then if you slice that in a certain direction of the plane, depending on what direction that plane is pointing, you get different kinds of curves and you get hyperbolas, you get parabolas, you get ellipses, you get circles. You also get some straight lines, which are considered degenerate forms of a hyperbola or various things. Um, and that's, so that's what you get. And so all these like very important sort of classic um, curves, and everyone's, if you've, if you've taken algebra, even if you hated it, you probably learned about parabolas. <laughs> um, but you know, don't worry about it. I'm not gonna go into the math of it. Well, I'm not gonna go into the calculations of it. But the thing is, is so what this is all about is it's all about um, the, the sun is making a certain sort of cone as it goes, as, it, as the earth turns. And at different times of the year, that cone is taller or it's flatter. Oh. And then the, the piece of paper that oh, you're this calling is your crazy. curve on is the plane that's intersecting. So here, here's my little cones here. Okay, so this is like at the summer solstice, you have a cone. You have to imagine this is actually going out infinitely yep. far. I drew, I drew this on the edge so you can see that it's a cone, but it's actually going like infinitely far. Um, and as we go from the summer solstice to the equinox to the winter solstice, we this cone flattens out to a plane and then down to a cone down at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then back up mm -hmm. again. So we have this oh, this is, this, is, this is a fun visualization. <laughs> this is where oh. I like having to like run these movies in my mind. Um, oh. Um, and I'm making a bunch of notes here. <laughs> Okay, so then the question is, is if so then if you, here, here this is the thing, this is why I say vector, and it, again, this does not matter to anybody else, it matters to me. The thing about this is, is that you don't have to have your tip of your cone at the center of the earth. If you can move that around in space, it's fine as long as it's pointing the same direction. Because what that's telling you is that you're looking in a certain direction to see the sun, and over the course of the day, you're still gonna look in all those different directions to see the sun which means I can move my cone, my cone at the tip of the stick that I've put in the ground. Oh, you are crazy. This is, this is, this is like so many moving parts here. Okay, yeah, keep, um, keep, keep going, keep going. <laughs> okay, no, this is gonna be great. So then, then, then this is the question now. So then, then I, I, I take my stick sticking out of the earth, and depending on what your latitude is, that stick is pointing in a different direction, but that cone that's made by the sun and, and one part of the cone is where the sun is, the other part is the shadow that's being, that's being cast mm -hmm. by the, the sun's rays being yep. blocked by the tip yep. of the stick. Um, and, but that cone is always vertical. Its axis is always lined up with the earth's axis. That was the part that I was really having a lot of trouble like sort of getting in my head. Um, so then the plane of the ground is going to intersect that cone at a certain angle. And depending on what angle, this is the part that I love about this, is that I can do all of this with very few actual numbers. Because <laughs> um, the best geometry is done without actual numbers. Um, I know, I, 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 feel, I, feel, I feel a little like, like I, I don't mean that it's bad when we use numbers in our journal, it just, it just pleases me when we don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, but, but uh, so the thing is, is that like how, what, what direction that plane of the ground is in relation to the cone determines what kind of curve we're going to get. So it turns out, I think, and, and again, this, these are my predictions. I have not tested them empirically yet. I need to, but I, in particular, I need to go to the Arctic and test this stuff empirically. That's where it gets really interesting. So, you know, someday. Um, someday I'll go to Alaska. 
Um, but yeah, so I worked out. So at the equator, where you were, this is where I, this is why I was I was sort of asking about this when you were showing your thing on the day. Um, at the equator, here's this cone, and on the summer solstice, the top part of the cone, the cone is at its sort of steepest. And here's the cone, and here's the shadow. So the plane is vertical because the stick sticking out of the equator, vertical relative to the Earth axis. And when that plane intersects the cone, we get a shape called a hyperbola. And we get, in particular, this hyperbola that's down here that you'll notice. Here's the stick sticking out from there. Right? And notice that because the sun is to the north, your shadow is always to the south. And so I believe this is more or less the shadow we've got. I don't know if you can see my dotted lines in here. There's so many. This is, this is why I was saying this is a draft here, because there's like so many things that I had feel like I had to add to this, this diagram and it starts to become very confusing. So I'm going to have to like redraw this and figure this out. But um, you can draw it with, with a hyperbola. You can draw on these dotted lines where on this side, it looks like it's turning into a straight line. And on this side, it's turning into a straight line. And if you draw those dotted lines in, those are called the asymptotes of the hyperbola. And I believe that those asymptotes, basically, you can't really see it, but those, those lines here, um, oh, actually, I drew a better version of this over here. Um, I believe that in when you are on the equator and it's the summer solstice, that these, these asymptotes actually, it's, it's as if you took that cone that I drew and you just sort of flattened it onto the ground, which means that this angle here or, or, or this angle here should be the same as the axial tilt of the Earth. Mm -hmm. So that's why, Jack, that's why I asked you on Tuesday, I said, it was this angle 23 and a half degrees as best you could measure? And I think that it will be. Um, obviously, of course, when you're you know, doing these things, uh, you know, uh, checking these things, you're do, do, doing these things physically, of course, there are always going to be some error that creeps in it, so it may not be. Um, but then if you, and then if you uh, wait and do, do the same experiment again on a different day, closer to the equinox, you should get a hyperbola that's more flat, that's closer to a straight line. And eventually on the equinox, you will get an yeah. actual straight yeah. line. And because you're on the equator, the sun passes directly overhead on the equinox, which means that for a moment that stick has no shadow, which means that straight line passes right through the stick. Yep. Um, and then you'll get the same hyperbola going up. So, um, but then, so that was just, okay, so this is, this is, I'm sorry, this is going to, like, I'm going to try. This is such like, an awesome try. rabbit hole. Okay, well, good. <laughs> but, but by, by the way, I, I do all my notes on my, my, my old calculus exams, because when I print out too many of my accidents, I just save them for scrap paper, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, so this, this, this was on the equator, right? So then, like, you know, what are we, so we're getting this, these, these curves, um, and take note of the distance between the the southernmost curve that you get on the summer solstice and the northernmost curve that you get on the winter solstice is that distance i believe is going to be fixed no matter what latitude you're at with some exceptions because when some weird stuff happens in the arctic um, <laughs> um but yeah, so then you start moving north, and I, I figured that's, 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 that's being northern hemisphere centric here because the whole thing is just mirrored in the southern hemisphere, so it all makes sense. But I said, okay, so you start moving north. Now all of a sudden, what's happening is, is you, two things are happening. Well, so, well, several things are happening. One is, is your, your cone is still vertical, but your plane is now tilting a bit because you are moving north a bit, and your, your up for you is no longer horizontal it's now it's your plane is sort of tilting relative to the earth's axis and that means that it intersects the cone in a different way and it's going to hit different things at different times so what i think is happening here is is that you're still going to get a straight line on the equinox but all of these hyperbolas have sort of shifted the whole thing is sort of shifted up and there'll be a different date of the year where you do get a curve that actually passes through the stick. Because there are two dates, in some, one in the spring, one in the summer, just before and after the equinox, where the sun is directly overhead at noon. And your hyperbolas get steeper, because you'll end up with a sort of a more extreme 
um, curves your hyperbola, I think. Again, this is all like what I, what I think from this. Keep, this is if you're in the tropics. This is you just like a little bit north of mm -hmm. the equator. When you hit the Tropic of Cancer, now on the summer solstice, the sun will be directly overhead at noon, which means that on that day, you're going to pass right through the stick. And every other day, you're going to have a curve that is north of where the stick is because, um, because the sun is always going to be to your south, except on the, on the summer solstice. So I think you're, you sort of moved everything up a little bit and your hyperbolas are also getting a bit steeper, but they still tend to flatten out as you approach the equinox and then get steeper as they go to the solstice. Yeah, I, I would have thought that the... Um, on the equinox, on the tropic, that the stick would be that the, the line would be the straight line. Yes. Uh, did I say it wrong? I, I think I, did I write? Yeah, let's we'll see. Yes. So I think that every location you are, with the exception <clears throat> of the Arctic, where things get weird, um, you're going to get a straight line for the shadow because that cone has flattened out into a plane. And if a plane intersects another plane, you get a line. But that, but that line is now north of where the stick was. So the, my, my red lines here are basically, um, you put your stick at the center of that. But that the straight line you get at the equinox is uh, north okay. of here. It is. Uh, but on the solstice, you're getting a hyperbola again. But so you're saying that the shadow would not pass through the stake. Wouldn't the pet shadow pass through the stake on the equinox? I don't think so, because we're on the Tropic of Cancer right now. We're not at the equator. I mean, um, I mean, I mean through on, on the solstice. On the solstice, it would. That's okay. why on the solstice, you can go right through that point. Right oh, oh, okay. I see what's happening. And this is the thing, there's like so many moving parts to this. I was just, I was making myself crazy, but I was going to be more crazy if I didn't, if I didn't like put it down on the paper. But, but it wouldn't pass through the stick and be a straight line? I don't think so. The source is, okay. That, I, so, here, like, okay, like this is what my model is telling me, but I haven't tested it. So, ah, it might be wrong. <laughs> but, but also this is just like I mean like I say I'm like barely able to hold this in my head as it is and this is and I'm drawing this cone but I'm only drawing one of the many cones that I would need to draw but I do think the cone is at its most steep here this is this is what I'm falling back on because this idea of conic sections that's an area that I feel very that i'm very secure in, in my understanding of and there's a lot of stuff i don't know about conic sections and a lot of stuff i've forgotten about them but the basic geometry of what kind of curve do you get when a plane intersects a cone at a certain angle that part i'm pretty familiar with and that was the part for me that convinced me why we had to have a hyperbola on this day this is it's really fun you have a you have a plane intersecting a cone at an angle that yeah. is not so shallow that it's parallel to the cone. That's when you start to get different kinds of shapes. Um, this is a sorry. glorious, glorious. Sorry, dude. <laughs> right. So then, and then, and then the thing is, it's not like that exciting as you sort of keep moving north. Like here, now I said, okay, what happens if we're in the temperate zones? So you're between the um, the Tropic of Cancer and the Arctic Circle. And all that happens is, is that the whole thing shifts up more. And so now every curve is passing north of the stick and never intersects the stick because you never have a point where the sun's directly overhead. Okay. Right, but they're all hyperbolas. And I'm counting that horizontal line as a hyperbola because I can say it's called a degenerate form. <laughs> Sorry, folks, this is like, <laughs> it's so technical. Um, and I think that what happens is, is basically like how sharp of an angle or how steep of an angle are the asymptotes of those hyperbolas it gets more and more extreme you get these hyperbolas that bend more and more and more the further north you are but also like more more when you're close to the solstice 
So then what happens at the Arctic, above the Arctic Circle? Well, may you ask? Well, what, well, what happens? Okay, so I'm on the Arctic Circle, what happens? Boom, you have a moment on the summer solstice where the plane of the ground is parallel to the side of the cone. Just in that one day on the summer solstice. And when that happens, what curve do you get when your plane intersects a cone? Now you get a parabola. And the difference really it looks very similar. I mean, if you're looking at them, looking at the two curves, you might not be able to tell the difference. But the difference is, is that hyperbola is always sort of going out, eventually turning into a straight line and another straight line out here that are going in different directions. It's approaching those two different asymptotes. Even if those asymptotes are very, very, very close to each other, it's still gonna approach two different asymptotes that the parabola is not. It's eventually getting steeper and steeper and steeper. And it's effectively as if it was approaching sort of straight down in this case. So it's a different kind of curve and it's, uh, um, so that's, that's what we get there. So on the summer solstice, at the Arctic Circle, that's when you're getting a parabola. And why? And what is the reason for that? The reason for that is because on the Arctic Circle, every other day of the year, the sun goes up and then it comes down, and then goes up and then comes down, right? But on the summer solstice, that's the one day of the year where the sun goes up and then just kisses the horizon and goes back up again. Mm -hmm. Right, and then the next day, then it goes up and goes back down, and and it's the day the sun just kisses the horizon, and that's essentially that's why you're getting this sort of like going to a straight line instead of, um, uh, instead instead of um, uh, going to these two separate asymptotes, basically, and it's and and and, three, and again the reason that, that I worked this out is because the plane of the ground. On that one day is parallel to the side of the cone. And on the winter solstice, you have something different. You have the one day of the year where the sun never actually comes up. Because mm -hmm. it's basically, it's below the horizon and it just kisses the horizon and it goes back down. And you get what I'm calling the phantom parabola. Because you're not actually ever going to see the shadow. But like that's technically what you're getting. <laughs> Or maybe you're just getting a sort of a straight line for just one moment, one instant where that stick actually casts a shadow and then it's gone again. And and just prior to that, and like the day before that, the day after that, you're getting a hyperbola that's very, very, very sharp, sharply bent. I think. Wow. And then <laughs> sorry, this is like going crazy. Oh, okay. So this is now we're above yeah. the Arctic. Yeah, I was gonna say it all gets really exciting. It all kicks off when you get to the Arctic, right? Now you're in the Arctic Circle. Now what's happening? Now you get almost all of the, the conic sections because you're going to get ellipses during the summer when the sun is overhead all day long. Yes, yes. And you're going to get the smallest ellipse when the sun is highest overhead, which is when it's the summer solstice. And then as the days go on and the sun sinks lower in the sky, you get these sort of bigger ellipses that sort of bulge out this way until boom. There's one day it turns into a parabola. That's the one day when all of a sudden the sun dips below the horizon for the first time. And then you get a period of time where the sun is rising and setting and rising and setting and you're getting these hyperboles again. And then you get to the equinox and again, you get a straight line. Mm -hmm. And then you get some more hyperboles going in the direction. And then eventually you hit a point where the sun just kisses the horizon and it goes back down again and you don't even really see it. And then there's a period of time and depending on where you are in the Arctic circle, you will have more or fewer days where you have no sun, but you get this one day where you get the phantom parabola, and then some number of days where you get nothing because there's no sun. Wow. Oh, this, this is why I need to go to the Arctic and like spend a year so I can do this because I wanna I wanna yes, see yes. this come down. I, I think you need to find where in the Arctic you can get clear days. Mm -hmm on your at your critical times yeah because you don't want to be there and be under a cloud right <clears throat> i mean theoretically like you wouldn't have to do it every single day because i think that you're going to you know 365 days of that's a lot of stuff and i want to go look at some bears that are going to be in the arctic 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> but um, so I don't want to be, you know, stuck to this one piece of paper for the entire time making making measurements. But uh, you know, if you can do it every few days when it's another there, and then all of a sudden you hit the North Pole, and now you're just doing circles for half the year. Yeah. And those circles are getting bigger and bigger and bigger as you approach oh, the equinox. Wow. Oh, so it is so equinox, use, The radius useful. goes to infinity. It's so useful to think of this from the perspective of the pole. Yes. Well, that was the thing. So I started off looking at this, and I'm like, when I was really making myself crazy with this, I'm like, okay, I know like, if I were at the North Pole, I could figure out what the sun's doing, and I could work backwards from that and figure out what shape it's going to be, and it would have to be circles, right? Yeah. And, and, so and then, then, and then, then when can, I came up with this, I was able to say, like, yeah, is that actually what I'm getting? Yes, it is. So it sort of fits. Mm-hmm. That's, and that's on the so cool. Equinox is when I think you're going to have the sun just seeing the horizon all yeah. the way around, which means you're going to get basically this sort of infinite radius circle. So that's, that's um, so, yeah. anyway, so that so that was the rabbit hole. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now I got it out of my brain. Now I can rest. <laughs> that that is uh, no. I, I I I'm afraid that this is just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, I think you're right. You know what though? I, th- I think we've hit a boiling point. <laughs> yeah. No. This is this is this is far from over, Susan. This is. Okay. I, I think that you're onto something here, and you're just. It's just getting started. This is really fun. <laughs> So I need to come up with some, I need to find some good spots where I can actually get more than a little sun here. Because the trouble is, is where I live, I'm like everything's surrounded by some buildings and so they're going to be a shadow. So I could start in the morning in one spot and do this and then pick up everything and move it to another spot where there's sun in the afternoon. But, you know, yeah. the working out the technical details of doing the experiment is always the challenging part. <laughs> so, so, so good places for, for getting some neat suns uh when i was in ecuador um you're on the equator but very often with the cloudy sky but in el duret in kenya um you had you had so you might have to also then go uh, after you spend some time in um above the arctic circle um that you might have to go uh, spend some quality time in Kenya. Well, I would, I would, you know, sign, sign me up. <laughs> All right. It's, uh, yeah, but uh, well, that, that is the trouble here is, is, you know, we've actually had a, a run of very clear, clear skies uh, and heat wave, and now it's cloudy again. But, uh, but we, yeah, we tend to get a lot of, lot of clouds in the summer. So the fall. Well, thank you, Th- thank you so much for, for, yes. for this. This is. I, well, thank it you for is so much <laughs> fun to sort of see how other people's minds work, and mm-hmm. I see why you couldn't get back to sleep mm-hmm. right. once you once you're on to the you, you figure you kind of got the tiger by the tail, mm-hmm. and you don't want to let it go. That is, um, and when we can get ourselves into that state, um, you know there are surprises, there are wonders in the world around us waiting for us to play with them that are. It's just so, so beautiful. Um, before we close here, let's bring in Vea to see what um, what you're thinking about. Um, I know you also are a co-conspirator in uh, deep geeking out about celestial things with, with Susan. Um, and also, what's on your mind? I was going to share, but I think I should oh, share well, next. Absolutely. Um, you should share. let's talk about let's talk about earth curves a bit more instead um instead um when you were holding up a particular drawing with the curves it almost made me think of the lines of a basketball and then it made me wonder if you were to take the middle of it where the x-axis is and instead fold the y-axis slightly then would those curves match the planes of the earth hmm. I mean, um like, no. I'm glad I numbered these pages. I'm going to lose track of them. I think it was the one just before that one, um, but I'm not sure. Um, I just wondered if you curved the x axis just a little bit, if it would make the, um, if it would suddenly make the 
curves here suddenly begin to conform to the curves of the, I don't know, it makes more sense in my head. I don't know, that's an interesting question. So it's, so what I would, what I would call this is basically taking this, this rectangular coordinates thing and mapping it onto a cylinder. Mm, okay, there we go. And yeah. now that's a good question. If we take a hyperbola and stick it on a cylinder, do I get do I end up with something that lands in a plane? Or like, for example, take your sheet and then just tilt it just a little bit. Um, oh, I mean, with 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 the curve still happening, just because I'm wondering if the perspective changes. Um, if the perspective changes, then does it begin to look like a straight line? I'm thinking about foreshortening the way that Jack does it. And so I'm wondering if those curves yeah. look a bit like lines in different parts. The thing I'm thinking is, is that this, this curve basically goes out in, or this, yeah, this goes in, infinitely far, almost as if it's a straight diagonal line. Right. So if I keep curving this back, if it were a cylinder, that, that curve is basically going to sort of wrap around forever in there, which means that that straight diagonal line is going to keep wrapping around. And if you looked at it from this angle, you're, what you're going to see, the projection of that's going to be a, a sine wave. Okay, cool. Very cool. So what, so what that tells me is that I think that if you took a portion of this curve and um, did, and did that, but it still wouldn't end up, it wouldn't lie in a plane. Okay. And so it might not appear, it would look more like a straight line. But I don't know. You know, the funny thing is, is that back in high school, I was fooling around with a problem involving an intersection of two cylinders where the answer turned out to be a hyperbola. And it was truly a true hyperbola actually includes both of these curves. Like these two curves together are actually mm -hmm. the one hyperbola. Yep. Because yep. it's the, the, that sort of double ended cone that's sliced there. Uh, and that, and yeah. Um, I said I imagine it more like a circle of light or maybe a circle of shadow that the sun casts when I'm seeing. This. And that may be those yeah. things I think of as being the angles of that shadow. As if we were looking Figure at out geometry in 3D is really fun, but, as but, 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 but can break your brain. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, but when, what if you had the sort of ellipse, parabola, hyperbola, you know, all in one version? Anyways, I, I'm um, excited to see how. But yeah, I, like what if you had just like, you know, you can't. That's why I say this is a draft year because I need to actually redraw these in a form that you can actually see them all. But um, yeah, like if, so, so the thing is, okay, so if, you, if you're taking the ellipse and you put it on a plane that's tilted, you can make that ellipse look back to a circle, right? Like a foreshortened yeah. circle is an ellipse. A foreshortened ellipse is either an even more foreshortened, an even more elliptical ellipse, or it can go back to a circle or a flatter ellipse. Um, I don't, th I think a foreshortened hyperbola will be mathematically another hyperbola, just a flatter one. Um, and a foreshortened parabola will be another another parabola. Technically, all parabolas are the same; they're just scaled up or scaled down. But that's another story. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, and, and that's different. You know, it's like like bending the, the paper, turning that plane into a cylinder, or turning it into a sphere, which I can't do because the curvature of the paper is zero and the curvature of the sphere is positive. Um, <laughs> but um, is different than just tilting. That plane, so you get different. That, which is which is why when you take when you try to take a sort of a pattern that you can draw on a plane and try and fit that onto an animal that has a curvature to its to its skin, you can't sort of look at the the, the foreshortening of everything as all one piece. You have to sort of think of every individual part of it and what direction is that part of the thing tilting. I have to go back to, you know, drawing patterns on animals like we were discussing mm -hmm. sometime. That's where I'm going. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, fun. this this is this is beautiful. Um, and it's just sort of in anything around us, there is infinite complexity, and there's 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 the thing you figure out. Then there's the thing behind the thing, and then there's the thing behind the thing behind the thing behind the thing. 
And um, sometimes there are pseudo scorpions lurking on your table that you didn't even realize were there. Yeah. I'm very jealous. I want to see a pseudo scorpion. <laughs> uh, it, it is. Um, yeah, it's yeah the 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 complexity the the the, the beauty the um it's like again it's sort of it's 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 like Grendel that you know this 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 terrible monster who comes into your mead hall and bashes everybody up and um, you, you you think that's the problem <laughs> so you go wrestle Grendel and tear his arm off and uh, hang it up and you're feeling pretty smug but what happens the next that. night <laughs> it's Grendel's mother it's Grendel's all the way down yeah it's it's Grendel's mother and Grendel's mother is mm -hmm. like you, you thought that Grendel was a problem you now have Grendel's mother and um, that is that's that's you know it's just like like you thought you kind of you know but but like but the complexity is just it's once we get this little piece figured out there's this whole other shell and beyond that this whole other shell this whole and, and, and uh, as d is saying um the, 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 there's there's beauty in that that's that that's that's beauty and then you're trying to you're, you're and then also like you're we're trying to take our little human brain and wrap it around you know first you know just a parabola and a hype parabola and then you're taking that and projecting it onto a cylinder or onto a plane or onto you know life is good isn't it kind of amazing that this like this this little piece of like fat and protein basically electric meat is yeah can can like figure out all this stuff and and build tools to figure it out better and yeah. you know <laughs> and 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 yeah. in spite of that it is like this thing it is still like it's, it's still just you know yeah. shadows on the wall of the cave and yes. and we're, we're just scratching the surface at what is is, is out here yeah, mm. but like this thing evolved like get fruit off of trees and avoid tigers and somehow we're using this <laughs> right, yeah fruit off trees and avoid tigers i like that in different times the year i mean <laughs> but and, wasn't made for that <laughs> and and how much fun it is just to try to 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 take it and see what it can do but then to also to do that with humility right mm. uh in in you know before this incredible spectacle of life itself that 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 that's something that I like about explanations in science is that we know that as close as we will get, we will never be there. Right. There's still, it's still this, 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 this model of the thing. It's not, it's not the thing. And um, there's a humility that is built into that scientific process that I really respect and appreciate. We mathematicians. No matter how our best arrogant. our best explanation, we can actually prove things. But <laughs> yeah, in in math you can do the proof. But your proof is always is always based on if these starting assumptions are true. Exactly. Exactly. And this conclusion. Yeah, you can do a proof because you say like these are the rules for say Euclidean geometry. Given mm -hmm. that, here's my proof. Q oh, you're in here. Oops, doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And here in with with the real world around us, we are. We're, we're, we're sitting here looking at the system, trying to figure out the rules of the system by watching how it behaves. But that's different than starting with the, the rule book. So that's why when we kind of come up with our explanations, we still, um, we, we, we have air bars on them. We have a little kind of pressure release valve that, you know, um, this is this is my best explanation so far, mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean that you can't figure anything out with science. It's incredibly useful. I mean, we can again launch a rocket, have it land um, on Mars, and then launch a helicopter off the back of that mm -hmm. little platform. Using That's pretty, pretty good understanding of gravitation. Yeah, but just approximations to the truth. 
Right. And it turns out that you were able to approximate it close enough so that you got within like, you know, 0. 0.002 million units right. of what you needed or something. Like we can we can approximate so well, but it doesn't matter that it's an approximation. Yeah. And, and so, so science is not about truth. That's for philosophy. Science is about coming up with useful explanations. Um, right. And then, then refining those more useful explanations explanations to make them more useful, more predictive, but that's different than philosophical truth. Mm -hmm. Mm. But even, even, in, even in math, that, that is, we'd be like to think about math as being somehow sort of separate from, from science. And, and in a way it is, I mean, there are obviously huge connections, but there's a, there's a way of thinking it's a bit different. But for all that we like to talk about math being very objective, the ways that we use math and the ways that we make that useful to us is very subjective. In fact, my, so my, my favorite math professor, Professor Alan Taylor, who's so awesome, um, uh, he, he would always say in class, I took, in math, we're not seeking truth, we're seeking understanding, which is, same thing we're doing in science, right? And then his point was, so we were talking, we were talking about, for example, there were, there's um, famously, there's a theorem called the four color theorem, which says if you can, any map that you could draw on a piece of paper, no matter how big the piece of paper, um, no matter how complicated that map is, but you're sort of breaking up into little regions. If you want to color that map so that every country is in, that you, with, with different colors, so that no two countries that, that share a border <laughs> Um, have the same colors. So, like I can make this one red and this one green, but I can't make them both green. But I can have them the green one over here as long as they don't touch. Right? It's like when you're drawing a map, you want to color all the countries or the states or whatever different colors. And there's a theorem that says that on a plane, you can always color a map using no more than four colors, and you'll always be able to do it. And it's a very cool theorem, and very and very very famous theorem in graph theory. It was famous not only because it was an, a long unsolved problem that people couldn't figure out how to prove, but um, because of the way that it was proved. And the way that it eventually got proved is, is that some people wrote a computer program. They basically, they, they worked, they, they sort of did a whole bunch of work to, to work out like, you know, I don't know, like, like 2,000 or so different cases that had to be checked. And I don't know the details of how this all worked, but they worked at some cases that was going to be very, very difficult for them to be able to do all the work. But they were able to write a computer program to actually check every single one of those cases and make sure that each of those cases worked the way they thought it would. And then that computer program you know, did all of the work and ran for you know, however many days or whatever it took to run the program. And eventually came up with, yes, this is, this is correct. Every case works the way you think it does, therefore, and they had proved that that, that, that was sufficient to prove it, and it works. And this was a huge controversy in the mathematical field of whether they had actually proved it or not. Even though, like, people could go, basically, you could go through and you could, you could check the computer program, and you could prove that that program does do what it claims to do, that it, that, that it works correctly, which means that the results of the program will tell you something true. And you can prove that the inputs they fit into the program are the inputs that are needed, that if those inputs are the correct inputs, then it will work. And basically you could prove every portion of this was, was gonna work, but in the end, it didn't actually explain to us why four colors is always sufficient for coloring a map. And so we have this, this, this theorem that has a sense of been proved, like nobody is genuinely convinced they're going to find a counterexample. But people didn't really like the idea that this that these folks had proved this theorem because it didn't actually explain anything. And we want proofs that actually help us understand something mm -hmm. and not just tell us what's true or not. And eventually that has become accepted as being, yes, the counters have improved the theorem. I think the fact that they could prove the program worked, I think was Kind of part of it, but yeah, it's you know, I mean, you know, if somebody someday comes up with a better proof of that theorem that a human can actually understand all the details of, it might take 200 pages, but that you know, then that will be a better proof of that theorem because we'll understand that somebody will. <laughs> this is beautiful, yeah, yeah.
So, to thank you so much for that. Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't want to go on uh, forever. I'm back. No, no, no. This is this yeah. is this is it. It just, um, just you know, it, it's it's fun to think about how deep the rabbit hole goes. Mm -hmm. Um, to 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 bring us out, let's take a look at what's been happening in Evea's journal. Um, if uh, that's okay. Um, it, is, it would take a while. Are you sure? Because we've already been here for about three hours, and I, three hours. how time flies! Oh, you're right. We yeah. have. <laughs> I want to share, but at the same time, I have a lot to share. So, do you think I ought to just? Okay. Why don't we then um, just call this a wrap for today? But the next time uh, we meet, let's do a deep dive into what's been happening in your journals. Okay. Thank you. I would love to do that. Okay. Um, Tuesday sound good? <laughs> yes, but after you, after we hear about what's happening in the and what happened right. in the lab, I'll, I'll share my 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 the 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 Galapagos COVID diaries. <laughs> yes. And um, how bad was your COVID? Um, I, can I, I was I was lucky. I was lucky, um, and. Uh, got a I've, I've been uh, vaccinated and triple boosted and um, didn't have it kind of took a little bit of the wind out of my sails for a little while but at no point did I wonder if I was going to die um, how long was your quarantine time there <clears throat> um, I uh, quarantined myself for uh, for five days and then for um and didn't travel for 10. so the <laughs> the, the 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 quick thought on that is that meant um i missed uh, most of the uh, expedition in the galapagos and just about all of the mainland ecuador um i couldn't rejoin the group because i was on the islands and didn't want to travel with um with my uh with my, my COVID. I, I think I got it sitting on the plane next to somebody who was not being as careful. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to give that little bit of virus an opportunity to jump to a new host. And then that's really thoughtful. I think the, the thing that's always difficult about trying to stop ap epidemics or pandemics is that there's a period where you're probably contagious and you don't even know you're sick yet. Right, right. At, at the start, it was also interesting to be in that place where I was starting to cough and then the dry cough and then more of a cough. And so you were really respiratory though. Yeah, and, and, and so, and, and to, to actually see, I mean, my wife is an infectious disease doctor and I'm familiar with, what the symptoms should look like but um all the sort of ways my my brain can you know just wants to tell you like no this isn't covid no this isn't covid no this isn't covid until finally you sort of buckle down and you're like i better test myself oh no it's not covid i, I actually the first time i tested myself I, I i i didn't get a positive result and then the next time i cut tested myself the next morning um it, uh, yep, two little bars on my test. Yeah. And uh, that's, you, you, you had a really tough go of it with yours. I had it earlier. I had it last September, but we it went through our house again in June, and I had it a second time. But that was more just kind of cold-like symptoms with some fatigue for me. My daughter, she we think she was the first one to have come down with it in our house in June. And um, she simultaneously had a UTI and she really didn't, she didn't really have any symptoms that seemed COVID other than maybe the fatigue, but that could also be the UTI. So yeah. it's, it's, I don't know. It's, it's uh, as uh, Zodachil is saying, denial is my middle name. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it is, um, it, it is interesting to be in that place when you really don't want something, you know, we, I, I, don't want to miss out. 
the uh, the bias that we have towards wanting things to be the way we want them to be really colors your thinking, and it was hum uh, humbling to be in that that sort of state, and then sort of also look. And there's also part when I was sick where I was also doing the the bargaining thing. <laughs> Um, of, you know, like, you know, it's probably okay if I do like this, but like, no, just stay in your motel room. <laughs> you just yeah. have to say bias. Which bias do you think that you had? I have to know, because yeah. we're talking about cognitive bias. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but the denial the, or the, yeah, the desirability information bias. or yeah, de desirability bias, okay. um, is uh, is the kind of kissing cousin of um, of confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is when you um, believe that something is true, then you sort of see it, you kind of project it onto everything around you. And then desirability bias is this um, other interesting version where um, to what degree what you want to be true how does that compare with what you think should be true? There's actually a really interesting research paper that was kind of teased out the differences between confirmation bias and um, desirability of bias. And do they do we tend to kind of go with what we want to be true? How does that? They're actually able to 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 tease out the difference between what we want to be true and what we believe will will will, will happen. Um, that was kind of an interesting study, but for me, I think it was desirable. Would be interesting bias. is where does your personality fixate towards? Mm -hmm. Like, are you are you a person who gets what you want because you read your bias in such a way, or are you a person like right now? My daughter's a person where everything's going wrong, and it's really about showing her like, hey, take in some other da sa sample data here to maybe change your perspective on these things. It isn't all bad. It isn't you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. all one way. Nothing's all one way. That's what I was. I wanted to speak up at the end of the science thing that I think, like, it's so important. Like, yes, we build on these proofs and we learn more and it goes deeper and we have greater understandings. But for a person learning, the idea of, and that's what nature journaling and, and stuff is all about, is actually doing it, seeing it, learning it yourself. Like, then it's not just information that got poured on top of you and ran off, like, water on dry soil but sunk in and you never forget the stuff that sinks in that you learn yourself in some experiential way um and that could be a physical experience or, or an emotional or you know a cognitive or but if you have that oh that never goes away you never forget that moment um of learning and then you can incorporate it and that is i don't know i think people who really um get a little religious, um, religious about science, like forget that part. Like, no, you have to be willing to pull that bottom Jenga block out and rebuild your whole tower because this piece of information doesn't work anymore. Um, and I don't know, that's a humility that needs to be always kept with a scientific thinking as well. Mm -hmm. so, you have to practice. Can I show you guys the name of my theme for today? Cause it amuses me. <laughs> I don't have the oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> did you see that guy <laughs> oh, very good <laughs> thank you for that um, uh, and Ray Bonto was asking about sort of what is bias um, so bi biases are are part of the efficient system in our brain for kind of quickly making decisions and it's they they are they are things that all of us all of us have and what um what what they uh t tend to, to to do is that you you, you kind of sort of have um a, a, a preference a, an inclination for uh for or against something and these kind of help us survive and sort of make snap judgments. 
you know, of things that I move towards and things that I move away um, from. I, I don't, you know, want to, you know, I, I, I generally have, I generally have a tiger aversion. Right. Um, and, um, what, uh, and there's a survival advantage to that, but then these, these, these kind of quick, um, kind of rule of thumb, they're kind of useful as a, as a rule of thumb. Um, but they don't apply to everything. And, and sometimes when we, uh, they can get in the way of our, of our critical thinking. Um, so there, there's something that is built into the thinking and reasoning of all human beings. Um, and being able to recognize them um, helps you to be able to compensate for the fact that they're there. You actually don't want to eliminate them entirely because they're actually, they're, they're useful strategies and kind of day to day getting through life on the planet. But, um, sometimes we, on, 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 on some things we want to sit down and kind of think more carefully and, 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 and slowly. And then, you know, they, they can, they can, they can, they can lead us astray. Um, and people will often talk about these in context of race, but bias can also apply to all sorts of things. You know, um, I'm giving an example just, just, just recently, um, speaking of, of COVID, uh, so I, I actually have just, just getting over a very mild case of COVID as well. Uh, in yeah. fact, today is officially day 10 after my uh, testing positive, which is after day 10 after my symptoms come. And I, so fortunately, it was very mild symptoms. I basically felt like I had not the worst cold I've ever had. Um, and, you know, the, the test was positive. Um, and so I initially, I had misread, I was reading some of the, the CDC instructions and things and then information. I was they give you a ton of information when you take the test. They give you all these links and then it's very confusing to find all the information. But like, how am I supposed to quarantine? What am I supposed to do? What, what, what do I do at home if I have roommates? All this stuff. So I was reading through it. And so initially I misread it and, and saw that it said that, that for uh, five days I had to be in isolation and the we determined that I needed to be uh, masked when at home um, and so on. So what I've been doing is if I'm in my bedroom, not, not masking, but anywhere else in my, my home, I was masking and also then using like, you know, cleaning wipes and things to wipe out anything we touch to keep my roommates safe. So far, they seem to have not gotten it. But I initially thought um, that after the five days that, that that was it, that I could you know, be done masking and everything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, later, there's the that, other five days, it, right? They reread it and said, Oh, actually, because after five days, you're allowed to go out in public now, but you have to stay masked. That's right, which is fine because I actually mask whenever I'm in public anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, but I then realized, Oh, this actually means I do need to continue masking at home because I am still contagious. And I really like there was a moment where I was just like, but I almost didn't read this. I could just pretend that I didn't read this because I'm really sick of masking in my own home. I have to want to go yes. to the kitchen. I have to put a mask on. It's so annoying. And there was a moment where I just wanted to, like, I don't know where I wanted to convince myself. Like, my roommates haven't gotten it yet, even though I wasn't, I was probably contagious before I, I got symptoms and they haven't gotten it. It's probably fine. And I had to stop it. No. Even though we are all vaccinated, we are not spreading this thing around to anybody. My roommate works with children. She's not, you know, so I had to keep doing the masking and everything. And to be honest, it was very annoying. And I'm extremely grateful that the most annoying thing about this was having to do the quarantine. Because it would be much worse if I either had much worse symptoms or was making other people sick. So yeah. I'm very glad that that was the, the bad part. Yeah. What's your thought on that, uh, Uvea? 
I was going to say something that I really admire about that is that um, not only with Susan wearing a mask at home, but then also you, Jack, the minute you got the sense that you might have COVID, you immediately isolated, even though it was probably very emotionally painful to leave the trip. One thing I really appreciate is that both of you put your concern and care and love for the community's well-being up to the front. And that is, was why we all masked and probably still do um, for so long is because we were putting the good of the community up first. And so I want to honor both of you for doing that and for doing that so intentionally and so readily in what was probably a very frightening moment for both of you, because I mean, it's not just any old ordinary cold, it's COVID, it's the plague. And on that note, you, the three of you here, Susan, Jack, Tracy, y'all survived the plague. Yeah. Like, we survived the plague of this lifetime. That's like y'all took part in a historic yeah. event. Okay. That's right. That's I, I don't mean I, I hope I hope it's the plague of this lifetime. Yeah. Oh god. Oh, god. Right. Instead so of the first who's version really of, young it. of their lifetime. Yeah. Let's say that. It's the plague of my daughter's lifetime because she's only 10 yeah. and hopefully yeah. she's I, I, I hope 90 it years be. still in her. Yeah. Um oh, gosh. yeah, but yeah. I mean my grandma, well, yeah, her her mother had before she started having kids did get the spanish flu back in 1918 oh. i think she actually got it in 1919 because it was still kind of around yeah. tapering down but yeah that's no so. it is it, it it is amazing though to 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 see those you know i i on hindsight I should have recognized that I had COVID early. Um, but the, um, and, but once I, I did, I, I made the right decisions, but it was really, really interesting to me to be in the same, exactly the same thing that, that Susan was talking about, where you're, you're reading the CDC guidelines and trying to, it, so um, basically, you get COVID, you go into isolation, you're not interacting with anybody. Um, people, you know, can leave some food at your door, you get your food, and then you're, you're first sitting just in your cabin on your boat by yourself. And every once in a while, the window turns towards one of the Galapagos Islands, you can look out, and you can see a, a frigate bird. Um, and then when you kind of get to shore, you make arrangements to, you know, get to a hotel, you lock yourself in one room and you stay there eating peanut butter and honey sandwiches um, until your, 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 your time is up. Um, but, but then there's, it, I had the same experience that you were talking about, Susan, where I'm, because then what, what happens is the, the tour of the Galapagos ends and the group that I'm with is then going on to flying to mainland Ecuador to spend a week, um, at a, um, in the cloud forest looking at, you know, toucans and crazy birds like that. And, um, you know, I wanted to be able to join them. And so I found myself looking at, <laughs> The, the sort of the guidelines um, and trying to find a justification why that is okay looking at the guidelines and but then you know you read it really carefully it's it was very clear you cannot travel for 10 days and so that would mean you cannot get on a plane getting on a plane is traveling <laughs> don't do that but but you know i was looking at these things like okay so you can go out in public as long as you're wearing a mask you know i guess it's okay but but you know, it was it was a very weird thing to have you know this kind of clear black and white thing in front of me and feeling like part of my brain not wanting to accept that that is really what it is saying so sort of very similar thing and so i ended up not traveling but I completely understand how our my, my brain was trying to convince me that it would be okay to get on a plane. 
you know? And you get away with it. And yeah, because I, I, I could get away with it. Um, you didn't need a positive test to travel you, or? I'll be fine. And or is that because you were vaccinated, you didn't need the positive test to travel? I, I don't know where it is all. Oh, yeah, they, 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 weren't, they weren't testing people. They're kind of going on the honor system. And, um, you know, uh, but, but what was interesting is to feel the pull, the lure of that. Like, you can see toucans and toucanettes this easily. Probably it's going to be fine. You know? Um, and you're a person who has studied biases a lot and you and you you're very aware of this kind yes. of thing. but when it's happening to you it's 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 hard and now, if it had happened at home you wouldn't have had such like tantalizing fruit hanging out there yeah i mean there, i mean i i felt like you know moses not being able to go into the promised land right or yeah. tantalus not being able to quench the thirst or get the grapes like i like nope 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 and but yeah, that, that 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 lure was it was so interesting to to feel that there's one of my my favorite um, so uh, Ray Bonto kind of a, a, a kind of the a closely related idea to this idea of biases um, is what we call logical fallacies and logical fallacies are things that just kind of natural things that our brains come up with like. You know, for instance, this happens and then this happens. Therefore, this must have caused this, right? You know, it, that's it's not necessarily true, but you can kind of see why a lot of people would, would think that. Ah, so uh, Avea's got a handy sheet of logical fallacies there. Ooh. So, what one of my favorite informal logical fallacies is called the GI Joe fallacy. And here's the way the GI Joe fallacy works. Um, is <laughs> um, so when I was a kid, uh, there were little dolls called GI Joe dolls, and then subsequently those got turned into little action figures. And in order to sell those action figures, I think Hasbro made this television show called GI Joe, where they had all these little heroes fighting bad guys. And at the very end of the uh, of each episode. Um, if, if, if I, I, I wasn't able to watch TV in my house, but if you went over to the next door neighbor's house, you could see the GI Joe show. Oh, so I would. And, um, so at the end of each episode there, they would have a, a group of small children kind of about to make some catastrophic decision, like let's go play in traffic. And then one of the GI Joes, would, the heroes would show up and say like, wait, don't play in traffic. That's a bad idea. You'll get hit by a car. And the kids are like, wow, playing in traffic's not a good idea? Now I know. And then G.I. Joe would turn to the screen and say, and now you know, and knowing, and knowing is half is the battle. Half the battle. <laughs> That's the G.I. Joe fallacy, that knowing is half the battle. That, that if, you can, if you know the cognitive bias um, or the logical fallacy, you won't make it. But you you still do, right? So, you know, people... But he didn't say knowing is all the battle. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah I'm not convinced it's a fallacy because, because he said knowing is half the battle. The other half of the battle is, is implementing that knowledge or acting on that knowledge or failing to act, um, you know, based on that knowledge. You know, I would say that the other half of the battle is character, which would mean acting based on that knowledge. Oh. And that's what got <laughs> tested for you in particular, your character. Did you allow temptation to draw you out of your quarantine? You did not. But people don't know that unless they face those moments. Ooh, uh, Tracy, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. But in any case, I'm, I'm an expert. I'm a mathematician, which means I'm really smart. And I just told you that that's not a fallacy, so you should listen to me. <laughs> uh, which brings us to the argument from authority fallacy. Um, I don't suffer from that one. That's uh, been the, the hard part of my life. <laughs> I, uh, I have to go experience it myself. The, um, um, ironically, experiencing it myself, I made, I, we got a new dog. And she 
is huge. She's 85 pounds. She just turned one year old and she had never been, her breeder had never taken her outside its home or the backyard. So now we have this gigantic dog who's afraid of everything. And later today, our trainer comes and helps us with it. Ooh. Yes. Um, but I was walking her and I, I put some orchids outside to enjoy the humidity and grow in a, under a tree that's hanging from a tree in this little pot. And I went under the tree and I bonked my head on it. And that, and me going, ow, made my dog afraid of this orchid. And I had to put the orchid down and have her sniff it. And she's still not convinced. I don't know. Those little spidery limbs of the orchid freak her out. But but here's this gigantic dog afraid of an orchid. But, you know, she has got to go out. I have to take her out to experience things so she's not afraid of things. Oh. So I guess she has a fear bias at this point yeah. in time. The, uh, yeah, a, a, a hyperactive sort of danger detector. Huh. That's pretty, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, and she's so big, people don't, like, why is she afraid she's big? Like, well, in her mind, she's not experienced much of the world, and it's scary. Yeah. That's right. And we, I didn't we, realize this, but big dogs, I had kind of suspected this working with dogs. Like, big dogs, in a way, are easier to train, because for one, they're right by your hip and your hand, and you can do a lot, where, like, a little dog's way down by your ankle, so if you're correcting it, on a heel or something you just can't get the you can't get there fast enough um you can't get there but just that big dogs they really look for leadership from their owners like the little dogs are more independent but the the big ones and that kind of goes against the uh, i guess the bias we would have as humans that big dogs don't need to be afraid of things but you know to survive in the world they they use fear as a learning tool. Some bigger, some smaller. <laughs> yeah, and the small ones are the brave ones. In fact, my poodle, she runs the show. She is, from the first day we brought this big dog home, she grabbed a little toy and just like trotted in front of him and through a small space, like also like um, thresholds are a position of power for dogs, like who goes through them first and who controls it, that's leadership. So my, my tiny nine pound dog, brand new squeaker toy in mouth, squeaking it, walks right by her in this tiny area. And the dog never messes with her. She just, she oh, eats the food first. She does whatever first. And um, yeah, and she just owns it. I'm like, she's just like such a chill little alpha dog. You know, she doesn't need, she, she doesn't have the Napoleon complex where she has to invade Europe to prove herself. Um, <laughs> so... But she just has her toy and she likes it. Hey, here's an interesting thing. Did you guys know? Talk about sort of talk about things we know from history that aren't true. Napoleon wasn't short. He wasn't really. Yeah, he was average height for people at that that time. However, the uh, English reported that he was short because hmm. um, that um, fit a narrative that they liked. Um, so we got that going for us. Now, we are uh, three hours and 19, 20 minutes into this. Um, I think it is about time for lunch, at least here in the San Francisco Bay Area and other parts of the world, time for dinner. Um, and um, I wanted to thank everybody who shared today for... Um, what they brought to the table. I would like to bring on, I see that uh, Gail is still with us here three hours into this. Um, <laughs> hey, my good friend, thank you so much for sharing with us uh, all that information about birds of Argentina. That was absolutely wonderful. Yeah, I enjoyed for, it a lot. Thank you both for the idea. This The, the idea for this program was Gail's idea, um, as well as... Um, the, uh, you prepared all those visuals for us, and uh, thank you so much. Um, really look forward to looking at other um, other uh, adventures that you have with your journal in hand. Okay. And to everybody here, have a really good day. Um, and um, I I hope that. Um, I, I hope that your day is, um, 
filled with wonder and beauty. Um, let's be kind. Let's be um, and be the, the the best that we can. Um, you know, sometimes when we get COVID, it's an it's 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 a, it's an opportunity to to test ourselves and to try to be even in that situation the best thing and, and, and to get ourselves tested. Yeah, that's right. Um, and um, thank you all. Um, I am really I, I missed you all. I really missed this community over the uh, the and it's it's wonderful to to get back with you, which is probably why we went into a. A, 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 th a three hour and 20 minute long playing session here. I, I myself am glad to be back as well. And um, like, I feel like I can be back. I was all hit and miss and it seems like I'm kind of coming through things. I've actually had a whole good month, July. I was tested. basically healthy every day, which was the first for me. Oh, so. That's, that's really good. In um, years. Welcome back. Welcome back. I'm really happy to hear that. It's also wonderful to see your smile again. <laughs> yeah, I think there was a lot of times I was like uh, you got you got you got hit pretty hard. Yeah. Um and just to kind of wrap up here, um hey Ray Bonto, could we get you to juggle for us? No? <laughs> no. Okay, we won't put you on the spotlight. Some other time, some other time. Um, uh, let's see. Well, it's very tricky to juggle with Rubik's cubes. I I, I know the the. Um, this one is particularly heavy. Um, <laughs> oh, so you've got different weight objects as well. Yeah. That's that's pretty cool. Um, did you know that uh, nature journaler Akshay is also teaches himself is teaching himself how to juggle um, as a way of just sort of being on a uh, kind of challenging part of some learning curve. Um, so uh, there's another juggling nature journal journaling. Thanks. <laughs> All right, dear friends, be well, take care, and Bye. we'll see Thank you soon. You. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.